The year was 1986, and I was crashing at a friend's place outside Tulsa, Oklahoma. Back then, I was young, a bit reckless, going where the wind took me. Call me Dylan. Anyway, his name was Chad, and his old man had left him this sprawling ranch house out in the middle of nowhere. Perfect, right? Cheap rent, good times, and absolutely zero adult supervision. We had this routine. Chad worked days at the local garage, and I'd usually bum around the place, maybe fix some stuff up, that kind of thing. Nights were for bonfires out back, a few beers, and watching the stars blaze across that wide Oklahoma sky. It was a simple life, but I liked it. At least, I did until that Wednesday. Chad came home from work looking pale as a ghost. Turns out, there was some bad stuff happening nearby. A woman had gone missing from a rest stop down the highway. Cops figured she'd been snatched. Maybe some drifter passing through. It sent shivers down my spine. We weren't total hicks out there, but it was still pretty isolated. Made you lock your doors, that's for sure. That night, I had a hard time sleeping. Kept hearing noises. Every creak of the old house, every rustle of the wind through the dry grass outside had me jumping. Stupid, I know, but the news about that woman, it messed with my head. Finally, I decided I needed some air. I crept out onto the porch, the night surprisingly warm for October. We had this big old barn out back, kind of half-collapsed and filled with rusty farm equipment. As I stared out towards it, swore I saw something shift in the shadows. Must have been moonlight playing tricks, but my gut told me different. I grabbed a flashlight, the heavy, metal kind, and headed out to check it out. The closer I got to the barn, the worse the feeling in my stomach grew. The air felt heavy, thick with an unexplainable dread. Every step, the floorboards under me groaned and creaked like they were protesting my presence. I reached the barn doors, massive and warped with age. The flashlight beam cut through the dusty interior, revealing broken-down tractors, piles of old hay, cobwebs shimmering in the dim light. Nothing seemed out of place, but that sense of wrongness hadn't faded. That's when I heard it, a low, guttural sound. It seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere at once. I froze, the flashlight beam trembling in my hand. I knew it wasn't an animal. It sounded too big, too, human. Hello? I called out, cursing myself for how my voice shook. No answer, just the echo of my own words fading into the barn's vast emptiness. Slowly, I took a step inside. The smell hit me then, like stale sweat mixed with the coppery tang of blood. My heart hammered in my chest, and I almost turned and ran. But something, maybe pure stubbornness, kept me going deeper into the shadows. The beam of the flashlight swept across a pile of old burlap sacks. And that's when I saw it, a foot sticking out. A woman's foot pale, lifeless. Bow rose in my throat. It was the missing woman. She wasn't just missing. She was dead. My mind was racing. Had to call the cops. Had to get out of there. But as I spun to run, something moved above me in the gloom of the rafters. My flashlight beam shot upwards, and a chill of pure terror ripped through me. Up there, crouched on a beam like some kind of monstrous gargoyle, was a man. He was huge, dressed in filthy overalls, muscles rippling under grease-stained skin. His face... It haunts my nightmares to this day. Sunken eyes, a wild, tangled beard, and a cruel smile that seemed to split his face in two. He didn't say a word, just watched me with those predator eyes. I knew in that moment, he was the one. The one who'd snatched that poor woman, who'd brought her here, and, 
God knows what else he'd done. Adrenaline coursed through me like fire. I dropped the flashlight, the clatter echoing in the stillness, as I turned and bolted. His laugh, a raspy, inhuman sound, chased me as I sprinted back towards the house. Every second was a blur. Lunges burning, stumbled over a tree root, almost going sprawling. My mind screamed at me to keep going. Don't look back. Just run, run, run. I burst through the back door of the house, slamming it shut, fumbling with the lock. Hands shaking, I grabbed the phone. Had to call the cops. But what would I tell them? Some crazy guy in the barn? They'd think I was drunk, or high, or both. And what about the woman? Her body. A pounding started on the back door. It rattled violently with each blow, making the whole house shudder. He was here. That madman was here. Chad! I yelled, desperation making my voice crack. Chad, where the hell are you? No answer. Just that pounding and his grunting, animalistic breaths on the other side of the door. Panic swallowed me whole. I couldn't stay here. He'd break through the door, and then... My eyes darted around the room and landed on Chad's old man's shotgun, mounted above the fireplace. I didn't know much about guns, but it was better than nothing. I grabbed it, hands fumbling with the shells Chad kept in a box on the mantelpiece. My heart was a drumbeat in my ears, drowning out everything except the pounding at the door. I loaded the gun, the click-clack echoing like thunderclaps in the silent room. There was a splintering crash. He was through. I don't know what I was thinking. Stupidity, pure and simple, I guess. I gripped the shotgun, burst out of the living room, and saw him standing in the hallway that twisted grin on his face. Before I could even raise the gun, he charged. I fired. Once, twice. The blasts were deafening in the closed space. He stumbled, a look of shock flickering across his face. I had time for one more shot before he was on me, knocking me to the ground. The shotgun flew from my grasp. We wrestled rolling across the floor, grunting and swearing. He was so damn strong, reeking of sweat and something rotten that made my stomach turn. My fingers scrabbled desperately for something, anything to fight back with. They closed around the fireplace poker, and I swung it wildly, catching him in the ribs. He roared, rage twisting his face into something monstrous. But it was enough, just for a moment. I scrambled to my feet, backed away, my eyes wild. He stood, breathing heavily, a hand pressed to his side. Dark blood seeped between his fingers. Shoulda run, boy, he snarled, his voice thick. Shoulda listened to your gut. That's when I heard the sirens. Thank God Chad kept a police scanner in the kitchen. They must have heard the gunshots. He knew it, too. He looked at me, a flicker of something like panic in his eyes, then bolted towards the front door. I ran after him, but he was already out, disappearing into the night like some shadowy beast. The cops arrived minutes later. I told them everything, choking on the words, the barn, the woman, the fight. They found her body, took my statement, asked a million questions. One cop, an older guy with kind eyes, kept telling me I'd done the right thing, the brave thing. But it didn't feel brave. It felt messy and awful, and something inside me was broken, a piece I knew I'd never get back. They never caught him. Said he probably slipped across the state lines and was long gone. The missing woman's face was plastered on the news, but no leads ever panned out. Eventually, things kind of quieted down. Chad came home, horrified. We packed up our stuff and left that ranch the next day. Never looked back. 
Sometimes, though, late at night, I still hear that laugh. I see his face, all wild and hungry, and the memory of that night drags me back into the darkness. They say some scars never really fade. Guess they're right. Maybe that guy in the barn, he's some local legend, a bogeyman they tell stories about around campfires. The year was 1993, and I was helping my buddy, Mason, renovate an old farmhouse in rural Louisiana. Back then, I was still green behind the ears, always looking for adventure. Call me Travis. Now, Mason, he was tight with money, so staying the night out there was cheaper than paying for a motel. The place was a bit of a fixer-upper, to say the least but it had a roof and running water, so I didn't complain much. That first night, the air was swampy, thick with mosquitoes, and the only sounds were the buzzing of insects and the croaking of frogs. Mason went to bed early, leaving me restless and craving a drink. I remembered seeing an old corner store a few miles back. Figured a six-pack and a bag of chips might help me get some shut-eye. The road out there was pitch black, barely lit except for my headlights. The store was one of those old-school places, its signs sputtering neon as I pulled up. It had that feeling, you know? Like something wasn't quite right. But I chalked it up to being tired and a bit on edge from being out in the middle of nowhere. Inside was just as creepy. Dusty shelves, flickering fluorescent lights and that stale smell of who knows what. The guy behind the counter, his name tag said Pete, was older, with thin, greasy hair and a permanent scowl. I grabbed my beer and chips, paid without making eye contact, and hustled back to my truck. As I was driving back towards the farmhouse, a figure stumbled out of the ditch, waving its arms frantically. My heart thrummed in my chest, not many folks walk those back roads, especially at that hour. I slowed down, my curiosity fighting with a creeping unease. When I got closer, I realized it was a woman. Young, maybe my age, clothes torn and dirty, eyes wide with terror. Help me, she gasped. Please, he's going to kill me. Before I could even process it, she flung open my passenger door and clambered inside. I hit the gas, adrenaline surging through me. Who? I yelled over the roaring engine. My, my ex, she stammered, chest heaving. He's crazy. Violent. He won't stop until. She choked back a sob. I stole a glance at her in the dim light. Scratches crisscrossed her face, and her eyes were filled with a desperate, pleading kind of fear. Something about her situation struck a chord in me. Reminded me of my kid sister, of the kind of trouble I tear the world apart to get her out of. We were nearing the farmhouse when a pair of headlights popped up in my rearview mirror, gaining on us fast. That's him, the woman screamed her voice tight with panic. He swerved recklessly, trying to force me off the road. This was no ordinary domestic dispute. My gut was screaming at me. This was something else entirely. We reached the farmhouse, tires kicking up gravel as I slammed it into park. Mason stumbled outside in his boxers, looking confused and irritated by the noise. Travis, what the hell? He started, then saw the woman hunched in my passenger seat and the car careening wildly down the driveway towards us. Get inside! I yelled at both of them, fumbling for the keys to the house. Just as Mason and the woman darted through the front door, I heard a crash. He'd taken out our mailbox, his car now just a crumpled shape at the end of the driveway. A figure emerged tall and broad-shouldered, bathed in the moonlight. 
The woman was whimpering now, clutching Mason's arm as they huddled in the corner of the darkened living room. I flipped on the lights, heart pounding like a drum in my ears. I wasn't a fighter, never had been, but this was my buddy's place, and there was an innocent woman depending on me. Adrenaline fueled a reckless sort of bravery, and then he stepped out of the darkness and onto the porch. We were face to face. He was a monster of a man, muscles rippling under his filthy clothes, a tangle of greasy black hair, and a beard that covered most of his face. But it was his eyes that got me. Pure black, with a predatory gleam that chilled me to the bone. The man on the porch grinned, showing teeth yellow as old corn. He didn't speak, just gave a low rumble of a laugh that made my skin crawl. Mason was whispering frantic questions to the woman, who just shook her head, her eyes locked on the monster at our door. Give me the girl, the man growled, his voice like gravel. Over my dead body, I retorted, adrenaline giving me a false sense of courage. He stepped forward, and I swear the whole house seemed to shudder. I grabbed a fireplace poker, the only weapon I could find. Maybe, just maybe, I could keep him at bay long enough for the cops to arrive. The hope was slim, out there in the middle of nowhere. We can talk about this. I tried, voice trembling slightly. Whatever problems you have with the girl, we can work it out. He lunged forward with shocking speed. I swung the poker, catching him in the ribs. He stumbled back, snarling in rage. I saw my opening. Run! I shouted at Mason and the woman. Get to the car, call the police! They scrambled for the back door, fumbling with the lock. The man, he was on me in a flash, shoving me back against the wall, his hand clamping around my throat. I struggled, clawing at his fingers, but his grip was like iron. Black spots danced in my vision. Then a gunshot. The sound echoed like thunder indoors. The man roared, his grip loosening just a fraction. I sucked in a desperate breath and wrenched myself free. The woman stood in the doorway, Mason's old shotgun trembling in her hands. Tears streamed down her face, but her eyes held a cold, determined fire. Another gunshot. This one hit its mark. He staggered, clutching his shoulder, and then he turned and ran. I stumbled outside, gasping for air as I watched him disappear into the darkness. Mason and the woman rushed over, a mix of fear and relief on their faces. He's hit, I gasped, but he's gone. Thank you, the woman whispered, her voice choked with emotion. I don't know what I would have done. The cops arrived what felt like hours later. They took our statements, examined the scene. One of them looked at the woman with a frown. Your name wouldn't happen to be Sarah Miller, would it? She nodded slowly, a flicker of something like resignation crossing her face. Listen, the cop said, his voice gentling slightly. We've been looking for you. There's been an incident. Your family. I'm so sorry. Sarah's face crumpled. A wail of raw grief tore from her throat. She collapsed against Mason, and he held her as she sobbed, a broken, wounded sound. The rest of the night was a blur. More cops, flashing lights, questions that seemed both urgent and irrelevant all at once. Somewhere in the chaos... I learned that Sarah's ex, the monster in the darkness, had murdered her family. She'd been lucky to escape, had been on the run ever since. They never caught him that night. Over the following weeks, there were sightings, rumors of him slipping through the bayou like a ghost. I stayed with Mason, the farmhouse suddenly feeling a whole lot less isolated with extra people around. Sarah stayed too a fragile, haunted presence among us. 
Eventually, things quieted down. Cops stopped patrolling so frequently. Life in that rural corner of Louisiana returned to its usual rhythm. Sarah moved on, trying to build some semblance of a new life, I suppose. Mason and I, we never really talked about it. There were some things words couldn't fix. But sometimes I wake up in a cold sweat, the sound of that gravelly laugh echoing in my ears. I see those black eyes, that feral hunger, and wonder, is he still out there? I suppose his name was probably something ordinary, something easily forgotten. But to me, he'll always be the butcher of the bayou, a whispered legend, a reminder of the darkness that hides in plain sight. It's 1978, out on some forgotten county road in rural Louisiana. The old Chevy rattles and shakes on those pothole-riddled roads. Gotta admit, it's got character, a classic rust bucket like you see in the movies. Still runs, though, which is all I really care about right now. It's hotter than hell, and I swear those mosquitoes get bigger the further south you go but you gotta hand it to my old man for a guy who drank himself half to death. He sure knew how to pick out a cheap place to live. Okay, maybe, live, is a strong word. I was staying with him for one reason and one reason alone. I was dead broke. Freshly nineteen, just got kicked out of my mom's place in New York. Figured the old man owed me at least that much, right? Turns out, the answer was no, not really. He'd never been the father of the year type. I guess even trailer parks have rent, and his job cutting trees wasn't exactly paying for a mansion. His trailer is so small it makes a sardine can feel roomy. One toilet, constantly on the fritz, and a single room for both of us to sleep. You can smell why I spend most of my time outside. At least there's trees around here. Makes the whole place feel less suffocating. His buddies come over sometimes, old guys who look like they've spent more of their lives drinking than working. You know the type, greasy t-shirts, bellies that hang over their belts, the kind who make crude jokes the second any girl walks by. My old man's no better, honestly. He calls me, kid, but it ain't exactly affectionate. Today, I got out of there real early. I tell myself it's to look for a job in town, but really I just need to breathe. This place makes you feel small, like your whole world is this tiny trailer and these dead-end streets. I spend my day driving, windows down, blasting whatever sounds good on the radio. Some old country ballad, Singer wailing about a lost dog or a cheating woman. Whatever it is, it fits the empty, dusty roads somehow. The sun starts to dip, turns the sky a million shades of orange and pink. Damn, it's pretty enough to almost make you forget how miserable everything else is. Almost. That's when my stomach decides to give a serious growl. I pull over into some busted-down grocery store parking lot. Feels like it's been abandoned for years, but I just need something to stop that hunger from gnawing at my guts. Turns out, there's one shelf of old canned beans and stale bread left inside. It'll taste like cardboard, but desperate times, right? My name's Jasper, by the way. Jasper Wells? Figured you ought to know... Just in case, well, never mind that. By the time I step back outside, it ain't just the sun that's gone down. Some real darkness rolled in, and fast. I try to start the Chevy, click, click, then nothing. Come on, old girl, I can't be stuck out here in the middle of nowhere. The keys jiggle in my hand, and for a second, there's a flicker beneath the hood, but still no go. Son of a... I mutter, kicking a tire. Guess I'm walking back to the trailer. At least it ain't raining. 
I stick to the edge of the road, even though it's so pitted and uneven I keep tripping over myself. The darkness is serious here, away from any town lights. My eyes scan left and right, trying to make out the shape of anything familiar. There's a rustle in the bushes, and I freeze, but it's just a possum scuttling away. I laugh at myself, seriously, Jasper, getting jumpy over a possum? Then I hear it again. Not an animal this time. It's footsteps. Someone's following me. My head swivels, but nobody's there. The air cracks with something snapping, could be a branch, but my gut tells me different. It feels more deliberate, calculated. My heart starts to pound, each beat drumming in my ears. I pick up the pace, half jogging, half stumbling down the road. The footsteps are louder now, matching my rhythm. I don't dare look back. Every time I think I hear them stop, they start up again, closer this time. A shadow passes a ways up ahead of me. Tall and broad, moves way too smooth for just some drunk or a lost hiker. Fear jolts through me, like lightning. It ain't just instinct anymore. This is real. I'm being hunted. I dart off the road, crashing through some thick undergrowth. I hear branches snapping, and whoever's after me curses, their voice rough and raspy. It gives me a surge of panicked energy, and I keep running. I trip over some roots and tumble downhill. I slam against the base of a tree, and the pain is blinding. I taste blood in my mouth and try to scramble up, but my ankle feels twisted, and my vision swims in and out. Above me, I see the shape of a man silhouetted against the faint moonlight. Big and solid, a hunting knife glinting in his hand. Who, what do you want? I manage to choke out. He doesn't answer. He just waits, watching me struggle. His build is bulky and broad, and I remember some of the nasty rumors about roughnecks in these parts. Guys who like to find someone, someone small and weak, and break them for fun. I get a good look at his face then. He's older, eyes like dark stones, face weathered and deeply lined. But the worst part is his smile. It's slow, crooked, and filled with the promise of pain. I scream and try to claw my way backwards, but I'm too dizzy. My head hits a rock, and I see stars flash before, and just when things couldn't get worse, the rain starts. Not a light drizzle, but the kind of downpour that could flood a whole town. Through my blurry vision, I see him raise that knife high above his head, ready to strike. I let out a scream that echoes through the trees, and suddenly lights. Car headlights. They swing onto the scene with a screech, blinding the man. He turns away, and I scramble deeper into the woods. My breaths come in harsh gasps as I crash through the undergrowth, heart drumming in my ears. I can't tell if he's following. The rain and my own panic create a blur of sound. Every rustle, every snap of a twig underfoot, feels like him creeping closer. I trip again, skin tearing against unseen branches. There's a flash of pain in my ankle, but I drag myself up, limping onwards. And then I see it, a flickering yellow sign poking out of the trees. Motel. A wave of relief washes over me. I burst out of the bushes, half crawling, half stumbling towards the building. I pound on the front door, rain soaking me to the bone. After a terrifying few moments, it creaks open, and a sleepy-eyed, middle-aged woman peers out. Please! I choke out. I need help. Someone, he tried to. The words die in my throat, and I just sob, the fear finally flooding out of me. The woman looks out into the night, eyes widening, and then she pulls me inside. 
She bundles me over to an old armchair and wraps a threadbare blanket around my shoulders. I can't stop shaking as I stammer out my story, the words pouring out in a jumbled mess. The woman listens, brow furrowed, and offers me some sweet, milky tea that burns my throat but calms my nerves a little. She doesn't ask about the trailer or who my old man is. I guess everyone in this town knows everyone else's business. Instead, she calls the police and sits with me until they arrive, two grumpy-looking deputies who question me about the attacker. They take me down to the station, ask for everything description, the knife, any details I can remember. They search the woods with flashlights, but there's no sign of him. It's like he disappeared into the rain. The woman from the motel, I later find out her name is Edna, testifies too, but she didn't see much, just a shadow in the downpour. The next day is a blur. The deputies search the woods again, to no avail. They ask more questions about my old man, his friends. There's whispers of outsider, and of rough men working on the pipeline construction, passing through, leaving nothing but trouble in their wake. I know those looks, the ones that wonder if I was lying, if maybe I had it coming. I'm exhausted, ankle throbbing, and just want to crawl into bed and forget. In the end, they call it in an attempted assault, but no real leads. I try to argue, to explain how this wasn't just some drunk guy who got out of hand. They pat my shoulder, say they'll do their best. But there's an unspoken doubt in their eyes, like they think I'm making it up, exaggerating. That's the thing about small towns, they don't like their secrets disturbed. Days turn into weeks. I stay with Edna at the motel. There's always a vacant room or two, and she won't take my money. My ankle heals enough to find some odd jobs in town, stocking shelves, washing dishes, anything to save some cash. Every time a stranger walks into the diner, my hands clench into fists. I spend my evenings at the town library, computer buzzing, searching old news records. There's a couple of unsolved missing person cases from around this area in the past decade, but they never link them always assume runaways or wild animals or just folks disappearing on purpose. And then I find it. A news report from a few years back, a grizzly find out near some hunting cabins. A man mutilated. They never solved it, no body to claim it. The victim's face, there's something in those eyes, in the newspaper photo. The resemblance, chilling. The date. It's so close to when my old man moved into that trailer. My stomach churns. Could he have been? No, he was just a drunk who yelled too loud, nothing more. But doubt worms its way through my mind. The way his buddies always looked at me, the way the old man would get this weird gleam in his eye sometimes, late at night, after one whiskey too many. And then I think of the attacker, his cold eyes, that crooked smile. I think of the missing men, and some part of me recognizes that same darkness. Maybe it's just fear playing tricks on me. But I think of his name, a name he never even said, and suddenly it fits. Butcher. The whispers around town, how it would have been something his friends called him. That smile, a butcher cutting meat. It's a leap, I know, a wild guess. But deep down, I start to believe it. I leave without saying goodbye to anyone. Get on the first bus going north, further away from that trailer, that town, that dark stretch of road. Even now, I look over my shoulder, checking for shadows in the crowds. I try not to think about butchers or missing men or those cold eyes glinting in the dark. But that night, it's always there, lurking in the corners of my dreams. Okay, 
so it's 1991, and let me tell you, Miami in the summer ain't all flashy nightclubs and beaches like in the movies. It's sweat, it's grimy, and it's tourists everywhere. Tourists like my old man. He decided to drag me here from Kansas, promising a week at the beach to make up for all those years he'd rather spend at the bottom of a bottle than with his only son. Like that's gonna fix anything. My name's Cody, by the way, Cody Turner. Figured I'd mention it since things, well, things tend to get a bit messy from here on out. Right now, we're staying in some rundown place near the edge of downtown. He swears up and down it's got charm, but all I see is peeling paint and roaches the size of your fist. He spends his days trying to hawk those cheap seashell keychains on the boardwalk, and I guess what I do with my time doesn't really matter to him. Which suits me fine, honestly. I spend my evenings wandering the city alone. Miami's a whole different beast at night. The party people all pour out onto the streets, drunk, loud, and smelling like cheap perfume and too much hairspray. It's the kind of scene that makes you feel both invisible and like there's eyes on you all the time. There's this one stretch of road off the main strip that's always quiet. Tonight I head towards it, needing the peace as much as the lack of crowds. Dim street lights flicker overhead, throwing weird, long shadows on some crumbling warehouses and empty storefronts. It's almost too quiet. All I hear are my sneakers scuffing on the cracked pavement and the ocean murmuring a few blocks over. I gotta admit, there's a creepiness in the air, something that makes the hairs on the back of my neck prickle. I tell myself I'm just being paranoid, that I'm still the outsider in this city, but the feeling lingers. That's when I hear it. A sound like footsteps behind me. I pick up my pace, heart thumping, almost tripping over myself trying to get to the next building. There's a bar there, I think, a grimy one but it'll have people, loud music, something to make me feel less like I'm out here all alone. A shadow crosses the dim pool of light from a street lamp ahead. Tall, broad-shouldered, and moving fast. Crap. I break into a run, the footsteps echoing my pace. There's a flicker of metal as the street lights catch the man's hand something glinting like a blade. My breath comes in ragged gasps as I make a break for the bar's entrance. But before I can get there... A hand clamps around my arm like a vice. He yanks me back into an alleyway, off the street in a flash. I stumble, hitting the wall. Panic rises up in my throat as I try to struggle free, barely even register his face under the dim lighting. It's all harsh angles and deep-set eyes that seem to swallow any stray light nearby. He's older, skin-weathered, and a half-unbuttoned shirt reveals a mess of tattoos swirling across his chest. My breath comes in hitches as he slams me back against the brick wall, a grunt leaving him. He's strong, and that knife gleams in the darkness. I can smell the cheap booze and sweat radiating off of him. Thought you could run, kid? His voice is rough and low, laced with a mean streak. Terror makes me blurt out the first stupid thought that crosses my mind. What? What do you want? And money? I don't have any. My words die out as his smile widens, showing broken, tobacco-stained teeth. It's not a smile most people would use to reassure you. I want. Well, kid, this is how it's gonna be. You gonna see what life's really like out here in the big city. What people do when there ain't no one watching, no one to care. He takes a step closer, the point of the knife hovering near my throat as a feral glint enters his eyes. Fear floods through me, so strong it makes me dizzy. He's not gonna let me go, not alive. He's one of those, the ones you read about in the papers, the monsters hiding in plain sight. I scramble around in my head, desperate for some way out of this. 
I'm too young to die like this, in a filthy alley with this maniac. My heart lodges itself in my throat, and I try to scramble and kick, but his grip is unyielding. There's a flash of the knife, and instinctively I close my eyes, bracing myself as he leans in closer, whispering foul words I've never even heard before. There's a scraping sound, like metal slicing through fabric, and I realize he's cutting through my shirt. A guttural moan escapes him, and a hot blast of his foul-smelling breath makes my skin crawl. Then lights, blinding white lights and the sharp screech of tires. Suddenly my attacker lets out a startled yelp as he stumbles back, clutching at his eyes. I scramble up, ripped shirt barely hanging on, and take a few panicked steps away. The car screeches to a halt, throwing up a cloud of dirt and pebbles as the passenger door swings open. A woman's voice, frantic, pierces the darkness. Hey! Leave him alone! I recognize her It's that red-haired girl working at the surf shop I walked by earlier today. She's brandishing a baseball bat, stepping between me and the man. The man squints at her hands still shielding his eyes. Stay out of this, girly, unless you want to get hurt. The girl stands her ground, hoisting the bat a little higher, and she shouts towards the car. Tommy! Call the cops! A second passes, and then headlights flare on a second car, pulling up behind the first. It's some guy with a buzz cut, looking built and mean, and I figure he must be Tommy. The man hisses in fury under his breath, and for a second, I think he might still go for us. But then, he glances at the two cars, the determined look on the girl's face. He lets out a growl of frustration and backs away, disappearing back into the shadows of the alley. I can't even speak, just stand there shaking as the girl and Tommy rush over. My legs feel like jelly and I realize my knees are scraped and bleeding from when he shoved me against the brick. You okay, kid? Tommy asks, brow furrowed, checking me over for injuries. I manage to nod, still catching my breath. The girl, her hand still gripping the bat, gives me a sympathetic look. You want us to go with you to a police station? Police? The word jolts a bit of sense back into me. My old man, he's gonna be furious if he finds out I've been hassling with cops, even if I was the one attacked. No, I just... I need to go back to my place. The pair exchange a glance, and then the girl offers a small, reassuring smile. All right, but hey, here. She scribbles something down on a crumpled up receipt from her shorts pocket and hands it to me. My name's Sandy. If you change your mind, or if that creep shows up again, the next few hours are a blur. I make it back to that dingy motel room somehow. My dad's snoring on the bed, an empty bottle beside him. I lie on the other bed, staring at the flickering light, trying to replay the whole thing in my head, but the adrenaline is making everything feel jittery and unreal. Days turn into nights and back again. I spend them locked in our room, too scared to even go down to the lobby for snacks. My old man never notices, too busy with his own drinking to think about much else. I keep imagining that man's dark eyes, those tattoos creeping across his chest, that smile. Sandy's number still sits crumpled on the bedside table. But I never call. I can't bring myself to tell anyone what happened. The cops, they ask questions, pry deeper. And then what? They check all the back alleys where homeless guys and junkies hang out, and he ain't gonna be in any of those places. Guys like that, they don't leave fingerprints and DNA clues like on TV. No, there's a darkness in this city that the cops can't touch. I start sleeping with a steak knife under my pillow, one hand wrapped around it even as nightmares chase me through my sleep. 
A week after the attack, my dad gets bored with Miami, decides it's time to move on. We pack up the battered old car and head out of town, the sea fading in the rearview mirror. Each state line we cross, I hope I'm leaving that alleyway further and further behind. But I know that's not how it works. That man, I see him everywhere, in truck drivers with bad teeth and sleazy guys at rest stops trying to sweet-talk some teenage girl runaway. My eyes dart around crowds, and every harsh voice sets my heart racing. Maybe he was what they call the night butcher. There'd been stories floating around those last few days, rumors about men disappearing, bodies found. Maybe, just maybe, Sandy and Tommy saved his next victim. I cling to that thought because the alternative, the idea that he's still out there, watching and waiting, that kind of fear follows you forever. Okay, so picture this. It's 1987, the tail end of the real wild 80s. I'm a senior in high school, stuck out in some nowhere town in Texas. My dad's a welder, and we follow the work, or at least, that's the theory. I can't remember how many cheap motels or dusty trailer parks I've called home. My name's Blake, by the way. Right now, we're in this little town called Pine Creek. The whole place smells like sawdust and stale coffee. I spend my days at the rundown school, mostly just trying to blend in and not get hassled by the mullet-sporting country boys who seem to think my faded jeans are grounds for an ass hoopin'. Afternoons, though, I have the best job ever, working at the Starlight, the old movie theater on the edge of town. This place is a time machine, man. Red velvet seats, flickering neon lights, the smell of buttered popcorn hanging heavy in the air. Mr. Garcia, the owner, he lets me pick the late-night flicks, so I go for all the cheesy horror ones with ridiculous amounts of fake blood and girls running in slow motion from bad guys with machetes. They're terrible, but somehow that's the whole fun of it. Tonight, it's some slasher movie called Camp Bloodbath, I swear these titles get worse each year. A few locals drift by, but the theater's mostly empty. I pop the tape in the projector, kick back at the back, and try to stay awake long enough for the first kill scene. About halfway through the movie, the lights flicker, and everything goes dark. Great, probably some teenagers decided to mess with the fuse box. I mutter fumbling around my pockets for my lighter. There's a sound then. Footsteps from down near the screen. I freeze, every instinct on high alert. It couldn't be the kids I'd seen hanging around earlier in the evening. These footsteps are slow, deliberate. And there's something else, like metal scraping on concrete. My heart races, and I start to edge back towards the projector room. I've got a baseball bat I keep back there for, well, situations like this. But even if I make it, there's no lock on the door. I hear a sharp intake of breath, and then the rasp of a voice cuts through the dark theater. Whatcha watchin', kid? I stumble, nearly dropping my lighter as the beam of a flashlight slices across the empty seats. It settles on me, blinding in the darkness. I can make out the shape of a man, tall, bulky, but beyond that, just a shadow holding the flashlight. My voice shakes as I answer. Some dumb horror movie. There's a low chuckle, devoid of any humor. The light glints off something. A knife? No, an axe. My blood runs cold. Come on down here, boy. Let's watch together. His voice is thick, slow, like he's got a mouthful of gravel. Something about the way he says it sends chills down my spine. There's a wrongness to it that makes me think run. But something in the back of my mind whispers he'll catch you, making my legs feel weak. 
He switches off the flashlight and steps back into the shadows. I'm closing the theater early tonight, I blurt out, my voice barely above a whisper. Maybe if I sound official, he'll back off. Please, just don't want to be rude now. He interrupts, his voice closer, maybe near the front row. The flashlight flicks on again, bobbing in the darkness as he walks along the aisles. He's toying with me, like a cat with a mouse. I back up, heart pounding against my ribs, and nearly trip over the cord for the projector. He must hear the stumble, because the flashlight beam swings back towards me, and he starts towards the back of the theater. Every step brings him closer, that glint of the axe blade winking in the light. I need a plan, but something's broken inside of me, replaced by a blind, panicked instinct to survive. There's gotta be something. I skin the room frantically. My hands brush against a cold metal box, the fire extinguisher. I turn back toward the approaching figure, the heavy box in my trembling hands. It's the only chance I've got. The man's closer now, only a few hours away. His footsteps seem to echo in the silence, and the smell of stale sweat and something sour like old meat fills the air. I hold the fire extinguisher tight against my stomach, trying to stop my hands from shaking. He has to reach the back of the theater eventually, and when he does... Suddenly, the projector springs back to life. The screen flickers, and those cheesy screams fill the air again. The man lets out a startled growl and spins around, temporarily blinded by the light. It's now or never. I squeeze my eyes shut and heft the fire extinguisher, swinging it in a wild arc. There's a solid clunk, a startled shout of pain, and the flashlight drops to the floor. For a few terrifying seconds, it's pitch black again. I hear him scramble. Maybe I knock the axe out of his hands? There's a curse, a stumble as he bumps into a seat, and then the rasp of his voice, furious, cuts through the darkness. You little, I'll find you, you son of a... His voice is close, way too close. I open my eyes, and in the dim light from the projector I see him staggering in my direction. I take a deep breath and let out a scream that echoes even above those on the movie. Then I turn and run, blindly, heading for the side exit door near the front. I can hear him behind me, his heavy footsteps getting louder, his curses echoing in the silent theater. I pray the old door isn't locked. My hands slam against the door, and panic surges as it doesn't move. Locked. Beside the door, a glass case holds a real fire axe. Without thinking, I smash my elbow against the glass, showering shards against the floor, and grab the axe. He's on me now, a dark silhouette with fury in his eyes. I raise the axe and scream again pure adrenaline making me roar like some creature out of the horror movies I love so much. He stumbles back, clearly startled by my sudden aggression. He's clutching his arm where I must have connected with the extinguisher. A siren wails in the distance. Someone must have heard the commotion, called the cops. He looks around the darkened theater, a flicker of doubt in his eyes and then he bolts for the main entrance. I stand there, trembling, still clutching the axe, as I watch him disappear into the night. The police arrive a few minutes later. They swarm the place, taking my statement, searching for clues, but all they find is the broken glass case and the man's dropped flashlight. It turns out, the old Starlight's security system is basically non-existent. I tell them everything, his slow way of talking, the sound of his footsteps against the concrete, the axe. The cops look at me with a mixture of sympathy and skepticism. After all, I was working late alone at an old movie theater, watching a slasher film. 
The next few weeks are a fog. News gets out around the small town. People avoid the starlight like the plague, and Mr. Garcia eventually closes it down. My dad gets laid off with the downturn in the construction work, so we pack up our stuff and leave Pine Creek. It takes a long time before I can go to another movie theater, and even now, decades later, the dim lighting and smell of popcorn still brings a cold sweat to my brow. They never caught the guy in the theater, but I hear things sometimes, rumors from other small towns about similar incidents, strange disappearances. Maybe it was just some creep who got his kicks out of scaring people. Or maybe I came face to face with something much worse, a guy the cops call the matinee slasher. I guess I'll never know for sure, but one thing's certain, those late nights at the old starlight changed something inside me, left a lingering fear that follows me even now. Okay, it was 1993. You ever have one of those nights you know you'll never forget, even while it's happening? This was gonna be one for sure. Me and my buddy, Derek, were driving back from a gig. I'm Wes, by the way, and we were a two-man band with bigger dreams than talent. This particular night, we were driving through some backwoods stretch of Virginia, middle of nowhere, when Derek's old van decided it had had enough. Sputtered and coughed its last right there on the side of the road. Great, Derek said, kicking a tire. Just great. It was past midnight, pitch black, and not another car in sight. Now, we were pretty resourceful guys. Figured we'd try sleeping in the van and flagging someone down in the morning. But man, that thing was cramped smelled like a gym locker, and within about half an hour, it was clear sleep wasn't happening. We got out, stretched, and tried to figure out where the hell we were. Thick woods on both sides of the road, barely any sign of civilization for miles. Think anyone lives around here? I asked. At that moment, somewhere in those woods, an owl hooted, the sound cutting through the night like something out of a horror movie. Derek shivered. I doubt it, man, he said, but it's worth a shot. Might be warmer than freezing our asses off out here. We decided to head into the woods, hoping to stumble upon a house or something. As we walked, I got this bad feeling in my gut. Like wrong place, wrong time kind of bad. But I kept it to myself. Derek was jumpy enough already. After a while, the flashlight beam Derek was holding flickered across something, a barbed wire fence. Odd thing to find in the middle of nowhere, but on the other side, we could just make out the shape of a small shack. Well, I'll be damned, Derek said. We climbed the fence and approached the shack. It looked abandoned, paint peeling, windows boarded up. Not what you'd call inviting. We knocked anyway. Nothing. The door handle rattled but it didn't budge. Derek sighed. Let's just head back to the van, man. This is a bust. I was about to agree when I saw something flicker inside the shack. A light? Derek saw it too, and we exchanged a look. Curiosity won out. Maybe someone is home after all. I said, trying to sound brave. I put my hand on the door and shoved it with my shoulder. Surprisingly, it creaked open with barely any resistance. That weird unease in my gut intensified. As we stepped inside, the first thing that hit me was the smell. Like rotting meat and something chemical. Made me want a gag. My flashlight beam cut through the gloom, landing on a workbench. Jars were scattered across it, filled with stuff I couldn't make out, cloudy liquids and what looked like chunks of something. A chill ran down my spine. We edged further into the room, 
and that's when we sawed the tools. Saws, hammers, knives, all kinds of nasty stuff. And what really messed me up, they were stained with what looked like dried blood. My breath quickened. Wes, Derek whispered, his voice shaking. We gotta get out of here. But as he turned to leave, the beam of his flashlight landed on something in the corner of the room. Something that made my blood freeze. It was a body. A dead body. Mutilated. My stomach turned. And standing over it, back turned towards us, was a figure. He was tall and thin, wearing dirty overalls and a wide-brimmed hat that hid his face. And in his hands he held, I don't even know how to describe it, like a hooked blade, gleaming in the weak light. He was doing something methodical to the body, something unspeakable. I don't remember making a decision. It was like pure instinct took over. I grabbed Derek's arm and yanked him towards the door. We didn't look back. We just stumbled out of that shack and ran. We tore through the woods like panicked deer. I could hear heavy footsteps pounding behind us, the man giving chase. Branches tore at my face. My heart was hammering so hard I thought it would explode. Derek tripped, nearly went down. Come on! I yelled, pulling him to his feet. We sprinted towards the fence. Just a little further and we'd be back on the road, some chance of escape, some shred of hope. But as we reached the barbed wire, a powerful hand clamped down on my shoulder. I screamed and spun around. The figure loomed over us, impossibly tall, his hat casting his face into deep shadow. In the dim light, the blade he held seemed to shine with an unholy glow. I struggled, kicking and thrashing, but he dragged me back like I was a rag doll. Derek was screaming, a terrified, desperate sound that made my heart clench. The blade shimmered in the moonlight as the man brought it down, and I closed my eyes, expecting a flash of pain, a flash of oblivion. Then, something clattered to the ground, and the pressure on my shoulder was gone. I opened my eyes. The man was frozen, his head whipped around, the blade forgotten in his hand. Something else was in the woods, something unseen, and it had his attention. I heard a rustle in the bushes, then a ragged growl, half human, half animal. Before I could process what was happening, another figure burst out of the darkness, tackling the man to the ground. The two figures were a blur of motion, wrestling in the dim light. The man let out a strangled yell, more surprised than pain. I saw the gleam of another blade, and that's when it hit me. This new figure must be another one of them, this sicko's partner. I bolted towards Derek, who was scrambling to his feet. Run! I yelled. We didn't need to be told twice. We tore through the undergrowth, back the way we came. The sounds of the struggle behind us echoed in the quiet night, making us run faster. Stumbling over roots and rocks, we scrambled over the barbed wire fence and back to the road. We collapsed on the asphalt, panting for breath. Finally, dared to look back. The woods were silent. We waited, hearts thundering, but no one emerged. Exhausted, terrified and confused, we staggered back to the van. Miraculously, it started right up. We didn't speak as Derek hit the gas, putting miles between us and that place. Back in town, we went straight to the cops. A couple of bored-looking officers took our report, but I knew they didn't believe us. We were just a couple of stoner musicians with too wild an imagination, rambling about some backwoods maniac. The next day, we drove back to the scene. The shack was still there. It looked even more sinister in the daylight. We didn't go inside. We didn't have to. There were police cars, an ambulance. 
yellow crime scene tape rippled in the breeze. I saw them unload a body bag. I turned away, bow rising in my throat. It could just as easily be me in there. The cops questioned us again, harder this time. They wanted names, descriptions, anything to help their investigation. I told them what I could, tried to remember every detail about the man, the shack, the mutilated body. The whole time, I kept thinking about the other figure, our unlikely savior. Who or what was it? Had it escaped the shack just like us? Was it out there, somewhere in the woods? Were there more like him? Shivers ran down my spine. In the end, they never caught anyone. They closed the case, labeled it unsolved, as if some things were just destined to remain mysteries. I never saw Derek again after that. He moved away, swore he'd never play another gig in the middle of nowhere. And me? Well, let's just say I don't go wandering off into strange woods in the middle of the night anymore. But sometimes, when I'm alone, I hear that inhuman growl echoing in my head. And that's when I think, maybe whoever that thing was, maybe they were hunting the same monster we were. I guess I'll never know for sure. And honestly, part of me doesn't want to. There are some secrets better left buried. And I have the feeling, if you dug deep enough, you might find his real name carved into one of those trees, the Hogslayer. Yeah, don't laugh, the news kept on calling him that as they never caught anyone so the rumors persisted. Maybe, just maybe, he was out there, doing something, something to people like the one we escaped from. Something brutal, yet strangely, just... Who knows? I'll certainly never forget that night. It was 2019, and I was crashing at my cousin Vinny's rundown apartment in a less than stellar part of Tampa, Florida. Not exactly the life I'd envisioned, especially since I had just gotten out of prison after doing a six-month stint for something dumb I won't go into. But hey, at least I was out. I'm Zach, by the way. Vinny was a scrawny dude always on edge, chain-smoking cigarettes like they were going out of style. Lately, he'd been acting extra jumpy, barely leaving the apartment. Something wasn't right with him, but when I asked, he'd just mumble about owing the wrong people money. One sweltering Florida night, while Vinny was out on one of his mysterious errands, I heard a knock at the door. Figuring it was him forgetting his keys, I opened without thinking. But it wasn't Vinny. A man stood there. Big. Hulking. He wore a worn-out leather jacket despite the heat, and had eyes that looked like they'd seen some terrible things. Something about him screamed danger, and my fight-or-flight instincts kicked in before my brain even had a chance to catch up. Vinny here? His voice was rough, like sandpaper. Nah, he's not. He'll be back later, I said, trying to sound casual even though my heart was pounding. This guy had to be the wrong people Vinny was so worried about. I don't got time for this, he said, pushing past me into the dimly lit apartment. It smelled of stale beer and unwashed laundry. I felt a wave of panic roll over me. This was bad, really bad. He began pacing his heavy boots studding against the cracked tile floor. Looking around, he fixed his gaze on a framed photo of me and Vinny, grinning at the camera from happier times. That Vinny? His voice was low, menacing. My mind raced. Lie. Tell the truth. Neither option seemed like a winner. That's my cousin, I said finally, deciding to just stall. He grunted and walked across the room, picking up the photo and examining it closely. My pulse quickened. You tell Vinny I'm looking for him. 
You tell him he needs to pay up or there'll be consequences. His eyes bored into mine, and I knew he wasn't fooling around. I'll, I'll let him know, I managed to stammer. He tossed the photo back down onto a battered coffee table and turned to leave. And Zack? He paused in the doorway, making my blood run cold. Might be best if you didn't stick around here either. Things are about to get messy. Then he was gone, leaving me alone in the oppressive silence of the apartment. My hands were shaking as I shoved a few things into a backpack. I didn't know where I was going, but I knew I had to get out of there. I thought about my family, but Vinny's not-so-subtle warning was clear. I was on my own now. For weeks I drifted, bus stations, cheap motels, wherever I could find a place to lay low. I kept seeing that guy's face in my mind, the cold stare, the way he exuded a sense of violence held barely in check. He was trouble, capitalized, and I just wanted to stay out of his way. One restless night, I was watching the news in a dingy motel room. The anchor was reporting a local crime story, and I tuned in more out of boredom than interest. Then I saw a photo of Vinny flash on the screen. He was dead. My breath caught in my throat. It felt like a weight was pressing down on my chest. The news report said he'd been found in an alley, overdosed. My gut told me it was a lie, that the guy who'd come to the apartment had something to do with it. I felt a surge of anger, and a cold fear slithering underneath it. Was I next? Just then, I heard a knock on the motel door. It was soft, almost hesitant. But after what had happened with Vinny, I was on edge. I grabbed a lamp from the bedside. The heavy base could be a makeshift weapon if I had to defend myself. Holding my makeshift weapon, I tiptoed to the door. My whole body was tense, ready to fight. I peered through the peephole, squinting into the dim hallway. My heart sank. There stood a woman, maybe in her early thirties. Her eyes were red and swollen, and she looked like she hadn't slept in days. Please, she whispered, her voice trembling. My name's Sarah. Vinny, Vinny was my brother. My grip on the lamp tightened, but I managed to find my voice. How do I know you're who you say you are? She reached into her pocket and pulled out a photo. It was old and faded, Vinny and a younger woman who must be Sarah, both younger and carefree. A wave of sadness washed over me. If I thought that, if I thought that guy who came to the apartment did something to Vinny. Sarah's voice trailed off, her eyes filling with tears again. Guilt nod at me. Maybe if I told Vinny everything, but it was too late for that now. I lowered the lamp. Come in, I said, opening the door. She stepped inside and I closed the door quickly, locking it behind her. This felt risky, but I couldn't leave her out there, not when danger clearly lurked in the shadows. Sarah collapsed on the worn-out bed her sobs echoing in the shabby room. I felt awkward and helpless. When she'd calmed down a bit, we talked. She told me about Vinny, how he'd fallen in with a bad crowd, gotten mixed up in drugs and gambling. He'd borrowed money he shouldn't have, from people you didn't cross. I started to put it all together. The guy at the apartment, Vinny's jumpiness, it all made terrible sense. Sarah looked at me with pleading eyes. Do you know where I can find him? This guy? My mind raced. Part of me wanted to run, to disappear. But another part, the part of me that felt disgusted with my own cowardice, knew I couldn't turn her away. I can't give you directions, I said, but I can show you where it happened. The next day, we drove back to Vinny's apartment. I hadn't been there since that night, and it felt wrong, like an open wound. 
Sarah clung to my arm, her knuckles white. I pointed out the doorway, described the guy as best I could. Her hand flew to her mouth, and another strangled sob escaped her lips. She sank to the ground, her body shaking with grief. There was nothing I could say, nothing that could take away her pain. Later that night, as I lay on the cheap motel bed, I couldn't shake the image of Sarah's devastation, or the cold, dead look in that guy's eyes. I knew, deep down, that I wasn't done with this. I couldn't just disappear, not while he was still out there. I knew it was dangerous, stupid even. But a sense of, well, not exactly justice, but something like it, burned inside me. I needed to find out who he was, why he'd come after Vinny. I owed Vinny that much, at least. The next day, I told Sarah my plan. She stared at me, shock etched on her face. Please, she whispered, don't do this. Don't get involved. It's already too late for that, I said, stealing my resolve. He knows who I am. Who knows what he'll do next? I started hanging out around the less reputable places in town, dingy bars, pool halls, the kinds of places Vinny used to frequent. Word travels fast in those circles, and I hoped the right people would start to notice me. It took weeks. Weeks of tense nights and empty leads. But finally, someone slipped. A jittery bartender whispered a name, Rico. Not much to go on, but it was a start. He didn't know much else, just that Rico was a collector, someone who fixed problems for people who didn't want to get their own hands dirty. I followed the scant threads of information I got, tracking a name here and a rumor there. It was slow and frustrating, and every shadow began to look like Rico. Every car idling too long filled me with dread. Weeks turned into months, and then suddenly, a breakthrough. One of the guys I'd been pressing for info mentioned a fight club, an underground operation in a warehouse district on the outskirts of town. It was a desperate lead, but honestly, I was starting to get desperate myself. The night I went to the warehouse, it was pouring rain. It soaked me through by the time I found the place, an unmarked building with boarded-up windows and a single battered door. I swallowed hard. This was likely insane. But I crept towards the building, heart drumming a frantic rhythm in my chest. As I got closer, I could hear muffled thuds and grunts from inside. I found another door around the back, cracked open just a bit. Peeking inside, I saw a makeshift arena and a crowd of shadowy figures cheering on two men beating the hell out of each other. Rico had to be here, right? I just had to figure out who he was. And then I saw him. Standing away from the crowd, a large, imposing figure. Even in the dim light, I recognized the leather jacket the hard set of his jaw. A name surfaced in my mind, Butcher. It suited him, I had to admit. He'd have to pay for what he did to Vinny and Sarah. But in those final moments, as I hatched a reckless plan to confront him, a different thought crept in. Did I really think I could take him? Or was I just another fool, about to go down the same dark path Vinny had? The aftermath of that wouldn't be pretty. It wouldn't bring Vinny back. He'd end up doing what he'd done to Vinny, and maybe I'd get myself killed in the process. Wouldn't that just be a fine way for my story to end? I remember it like yesterday 1952 in the sweltering heat of Phoenix. I was 25, just a kid really, stuck living with my old man after a stint in the army. It was one of those trailers on the outskirts of town, the kind they build so damn close together, you can smell your neighbor frying onions through the wall. My dad, 
Everett, he wasn't a bad guy. A bit rough around the edges, sure, and I couldn't count the number of beers he'd put away by the time I got home from work. But he was family, you know? Nights, I'd work at the gas station on the edge of the highway, mostly watching tumbleweeds roll past. Not exactly glamorous, but it paid the bills. One night, just after midnight, I was wiping down the windshield of this dusty Ford when a scraggly-looking fella pulls up. He gives me that tired grin truckers get after too long on the road. Guy steps out, all lanky with a greasy ball cap, and strolls inside. He buys a pack of smokes, a candy bar, and one of those little bottles of whiskey. I ain't one to judge, so I make no comment when he stumbles into the shadowed corner booth and starts pouring the liquor down his throat. Figured he'd finish up and be on his way. About fifteen minutes later, a young woman comes bursting through the door. She's blonde and frantic, eyes wide as a spooked horse. Have you seen a man? Tall, real thin, got a limp? She asks, almost breathless. I tell her about the trucker, and she practically sprints over to the booth. I hear them talking for a few minutes, muffled, before a blood-curdling scream rips through the air. Heart pounding, I grab a tire iron and head towards the commotion. The woman's in hysterics. We just got married yesterday. She sobs. He said he needed a drink, and then he just, just vanished. The booth was empty, not even a trace of the greasy hat. I skin the parking lot, thinking the guy must have slipped out the back door, but there's no sign of him. Cops are called. They ask questions, look for some clue, but there's nothing. It's like the dude melted into thin air. They don't believe a word the woman says, think she's making a big fuss, but she swears the fellow walked right in there behind her. Me, I'm starting to wonder if I had one too many beers myself. Couple of weeks roll by, and everyone's forgotten. Everyone except me, that is. Every time I walked past that damn booth, my stomach twisted into knots. I tried to convince myself I must have imagined it all. Hell, with the desert heat, maybe I had a touch of sunstroke that night. But that woman screamed. The sheer terror, that was real. Things get stranger. Turns out, the gas station had a reputation I never knew about. Before I started working there, a mechanic went missing in broad daylight. Nobody ever caught whoever did it. They just disappeared into thin air. Another guy said he saw a tall stranger loitering in the shadows near the station, right before the place got robbed. Folks start murmuring that the place is cursed. Most of them stay away from there after dark, scared of whatever is snatching people up. Now, I'm not one for superstition, but it starts to gnaw at me. One lonely night shift, I swear I hear footsteps right outside. I grab the tire iron tight, ready to fight back. But when I open the door, there's nothing but the desert wind kicking up dust devils. Maybe I'm working too many hours. Maybe I'm just going crazy. One day, Everett comes up to me after I get home from work, looking grim. He hands me a newspaper with a headline about another trucker going missing, this time down in New Mexico. There's a description, he says, his voice barely above a whisper. It says they're looking for a tall, skinny fella, got a limp. Just like that guy you saw. A chill runs down my spine. I can't believe it. The hair on my neck stands on end. I grab the paper, staring intently at the blurry sketch. I don't know how anyone could recognize a face from that, but I know. It's the same man who was sitting in my gas station. Suddenly, every creak in the trailer sounds like footsteps lurking just outside. The desert silence seems to press in, suffocating. Pops, I finally choke out. 
I think someone might be hunting people out there. Someone not, not normal. Everett looks back at me with a mixture of pity and fear in his eyes. Son, he says, I think you need to get yourself out of here, and fast. I ain't saying it's ghosts, but whatever's out there, it ain't good. I know then that he's right. I quit my job that very day, and a week later, I'm on a bus headed north, leaving Phoenix far behind. Every shadow on that highway sets my teeth on edge. Every time a stranger looks at me too long, my palms sweat and my heart thunders in my chest. Even when I finally make it to Portland, settle into a tiny apartment, and find a new gas station to work at, I still check the booths before every shift. I never tell anyone what happened. They'd think I was nuts. Hell, most of the time, I think I'm nuts. But sometimes, late at night, I can't sleep. The image of that empty booth flashes into my mind. I hear that woman scream, and I wonder if that fella had victims long before that night I saw him. I wonder how many vanished without a trace, with only a panicked stranger and a baffled gas station attendant bearing witness. And I wonder what was out there in the shadows, watching, waiting. Okay, picture this, 1958, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Back then, there were still stretches of highway with nothing but prairie brush for miles. Me, I was 26, living alone in a tiny one-room rental on the outskirts of town. Work nights at an old-school diner frequented by lonely truckers and folks who preferred to keep to themselves. Life wasn't glamorous but it was my life. See, folks back then called me Eddie the Enigma. I ain't never been a great conversationalist, but I could listen for hours. Some nights, those truckers would spill their guts to me, heartbreak, bad deals, whatever burdens weighed them down on the long haul. I was just a pair of ears behind the greasy counter, but every man needs a confessional sometimes. Even then my intuition was good, if I do say so myself. It was like I could read a guy's troubles just by the way he slumped down onto a barstool. One Tuesday night, a fella named Joe slides in, his face all drawn and haggard. I put on my Eddie the Enigma act, refilling his coffee without a word while he stared into the dark liquid. About an hour later, he finally starts to talk, low and rough like gravel. Turns out Joe had been hauling a load of cattle, his rig breaking down smack dab in the middle of nowhere. While he was under the hood, tinkering with the engine, this ragged a man comes out of the brush, offering help. Joe, bless his country boy heart, trusted the stranger, even invited him into the cab for a swig of whiskey. But, and this is where it all went bad, Joe blacked out. He woke up tied to a tree, his cattle gone, and the stranger nowhere to be found. Joe spent days out there, barely getting himself loose before managing to flag down some help. I pour the guy another cup, trying to show some sympathy, but I'm also sizing him up. Sure, Joe looked ragged as hell but his story seemed a little far-fetched. I mean, who ties up a trucker and steals their whole damn herd in broad daylight? Over the next few weeks, those whispers start rippling through the diner. Turns out, Joe ain't the first one. Truckers all up and down the highway disappear, or turn up robbed blind, mumbling about some tall, gaunt figure who melts into the shadows like he's a ghost. Folks start calling him the highway ghost, and the fear sets in deep. The truckers ain't taking any chances. They're convoying together, carrying guns, and no one's stopping for a stranger on the roadside, no matter how much help they seem to need. Meanwhile, I'm getting jumpy, too. 
Every shadow outside the diner's window makes my heart pound. Closing up at night becomes a damn nightmare. I start double-checking the locks, keeping a heavy wrench under the counter, just in case. Hell, my sleep gets so ragged, I'm practically on autopilot half the time, which ain't safe when you're cooking up eggs over a hot stove. Now, I'm no hero, but I do got a sense of right and wrong. One night, a trucker tells me he's heard the highway ghost has been spotted up near some old abandoned grain silos north of town. Says they reckon he's using them as a hideout, maybe stashing stolen goods. My first instinct is to keep my nose clean, but those whispers about vanishing men, they settle in my gut like a bad meal. So, the next day, I do the fool thing. I borrow a friend's old pickup, drive out to those silos, and start poking around. The place is creepy as all hell, rusted metal, busted windows, the whole nine yards. It's clear someone's been using it, probably more than one someone. That's when I see it, an empty cattle trailer out the back. My hands start shaking. This ain't some kids messing around, this is the real deal. Right as I'm debating whether I should hightail it back to Tulsa, I hear a noise. It's like a scraping sound, coming from inside the silo. I freeze, every muscle tensing up. Then I hear a low groan that sends chills down my spine. Someone, or something, is in there. Curiosity mixed with fear turns my legs to lead, but somehow, I manage to creep towards a half-open door. I peek inside, squinting in the dusty light. And that's when I see him. Tall, thin as a willow branch, with long, greasy hair covering half his face. There's a flicker of madness in his eyes as he hunches over something on the floor. It takes me a moment of horror to realize it's a man, bound and gagged, barely conscious. The highway ghost turns his head, and our eyes lock. For a second, time seems to freeze. He lunges towards me, his face twisted in rage. My body shifts into survival mode before my brain catches up. Adrenaline kicks in, and I'm already scrambling backwards, half tripping over some old scrap metal in my haste. He lets out a guttural roar like a wounded beast and bursts out of the silo after me. I run blindly my breath hitching in panicked gasps. My boots skid in the gravel as I swerve around an old combine harvester, my heart hammering against my ribs. Every rustle of wind, every crunch of dry leaves underfoot sounds like him barreling towards me. Desperation gives me a burst of speed, and I dash for my rusty pickup truck. If I can just get the keys out of my pocket, fumbling like an idiot— if the damn engine turns over. He snatches at the back of my shirt, tearing a chunk of fabric, and a wave of dizziness washes over me. Is this how it ends? Me, sprawled across the dirt beside some forgotten silo, another victim of the highway ghost? That thought propels me forward. I wrench the driver's door open, dive inside, and slam it shut. He's on me in an instant, pounding at the window with surprising strength. The glass shutters, cracks spider webbing out from the impact. I can see his wild, bloodshot eyes, the filthy beard matted around his mouth. He's yelling, but the words are muffled, a frenzy of pure rage. My hands tremble as I fumble for the ignition, the key feeling impossibly heavy. The engine sputters, then finally roars to life. Slamming the truck into gear, I stomp on the gas, tearing out of there in a cloud of dust. In the rearview mirror, I see him standing amidst the abandoned machinery, a lone figure shrinking into the encroaching dusk. But even as I gain some distance, the fear doesn't subside. It coils like a snake in my gut, the image of that bound man and those crazed eyes burned into my memory. I spend the night driving, too terrified to stop. 
I wind up in Oklahoma City at dawn, haggard and jumpy. The police are skeptical when I report what I saw. Sure, they know about the ghost, but they think I'm just some rattled guy making up stories. It takes a lot of convincing, but finally they agree to check out those silos. In the end, they discover an entire stash of stolen goods, evidence of several missing truckers, but no sign of the highway ghost himself. He just vanishes into thin air, like he'd never been there at all. News reports paint me as a hero, the one guy who escaped and lived to tell the tale, but that's not how I feel. Out there somewhere, he's still walking the shadows, biding his time, haunting the lonely stretches of highway. Afterward, folks still talk about the highway ghost. Sometimes I catch snippets of those conversations at rest stops and truck stop diners. Some say he was driven mad by isolation. Others whisper that it's some kind of evil spirit preying on the vulnerable. And every now and then, someone new disappears, fueling the legend. For me, life doesn't quite go back to normal. The diner starts to feel too claustrophobic, and even sleep offers no solace. My dreams plagued by the man in the silo and his bloodshot eyes. So I leave Tulsa, drifting across the country, working out jobs, and never staying in one place too long. I suppose the highway ghost gave me a kind of twisted gift, a life on the run, always glancing over my shoulder, never sure if he's out there, lurking. Even years later, sometimes I'm riding a bus through some remote town, or crossing a state line, and I'll see a long, thin figure out of the corner of my eye. And every time, my heart skips a beat, the old terror rising up like bile in my throat. Truth be told, I reckon his real name was Loneliness, and he's a demon that haunts us all. I moved into my father's small cabin in the woods near Mount Hood back in 1997. Old man Warner was always a recluse, choosing isolation out here in the Oregon mountains for my entire life. Said it was quieter, that the trees kept him sane. I never understood that, the isolation part. Me, I've always been a city person, but I was down on my luck and he didn't make me pay rent so I didn't see much choice. His name is John Warner. Mine is Richard Warner. So I settled into this weird backwards cabin. It had been built in the 1940s, all logs and rough-hewn boards. Just two rooms, no electricity, no plumbing. Just an outhouse and a stream for water. But the location was incredible. Thick evergreen forest, Mist in the mornings, a clear view of the mountain top. Kinda grew on you, even if I was counting down the days until I could escape. First week started out normal enough. I'd hike around, explore the area. Mostly I just sat on the porch reading, taking it easy. One afternoon, I was doing just that when I heard a snap down in the trees. I looked up but I didn't see anything. Just the wind rustling the leaves. Figured it was a deer or something. Then it happened again, closer this time, followed by a heavy thud. I was on my feet instantly, my skin prickling. Heart did this weird, uncomfortable thud against my ribs. That's the type of place this is. Once the sun starts dipping, that primeval fear takes over. Something deep down tells you that you're no longer top of the food chain. I scanned the tree lean. Nothing. I was about to dismiss it when a chill slithered up my spine. I saw movement, a flash of something off-white bobbing behind a big spruce, just gone as quick as it appeared. My pulse quickened. Hello? I called out, my voice sounding weak. Silence stretched out punctuated by the evening song of birds, uncaring and oblivious. 
Taking a deep breath, I picked up a fallen branch from the ground. It was pathetically thin, but the weight in my hand felt comforting. I cautiously stalked towards the big spruce, the branch held out in front of me like a shield. Nothing behind it, just more trees and the descending gloom. But the feeling of being watched, that didn't fade. It clung to me like a cold sweat. I made a quick circuit around the house, checking every possible hiding spot. Nothing. Frustrated, and more than a little spooked, I stomped back up to the porch, tossing the branch aside. Damn animals, I muttered, trying to convince myself. But that flash of white. It hadn't looked like any creature I knew. Too tall, too thin, and whatever the hell it was, it had been watching me. The first night was rough. The cabin creaked ominously in the silence, and every rustle outside sent my mind racing. I barricaded the door with the rickety old table and fell asleep only when exhaustion overtook fear. The next morning, I felt like an idiot. I walked around the cabin in the bright daylight and saw nothing but the footprints of some critter, too small to be a bear. So maybe I was a little too city-fied, getting nervous over nothing. I even cracked a joke to myself about Bigfoot on vacation. I decided to make up for my paranoia with a long hike. Strapped on my backpack and headed off towards the mountain, the path curving deeper into the woods. A couple of hours in, I found a pristine little lake I'd never seen before. It made me pause, realizing how little I actually knew the area. Seemed a little reckless, considering how easily you could get lost in these woods. There was something unsettling about the lake, though. No birdsong, no insects buzzing. Just an unnatural stillness. It gave me the chills, and I was about to head back when I noticed something odd at the far edge of the water. It was a deer carcass, half submerged and stripped down to bone in some places. Now, animal remains aren't unusual, but the way it was laid out, the ribs were splayed open, almost like a grotesque display. A wave of nausea swept over me. I crept closer, unable to look away. There were deep gouges in the bones, some sort of tooth mark. But the marks were too wide for a mountain lion, too jagged for a bear. Something about this whole scene screamed wrong. I took pictures, more to convince myself that what I was seeing was real than for any other reason. Whatever had done this, I didn't want to tangle with it. I turned to go, my nerves jangling, when I heard it. A snap from behind me. It was loud, so close it made me jump and whirl around. There, half hidden amongst the trees, I saw it again. That lanky, off-white form but clearer this time. Tall, at least eight feet, with impossibly long, thin limbs. Its head, it was bald and elongated, no visible eyes or mouth, just smooth, pale skin stretched tight. I froze, paralyzed with fear. It just stood there, watching. My mind couldn't make sense of what it was seeing. This thing didn't belong in the natural order. It was some kind of aberration. Finally, instinct kicked in. I screamed, more of a raw, animalistic roar, and took off running. I stumbled and fell, branches tearing at my clothes and skin. Didn't matter. I just got up and kept running, my lungs burning, heart ready to explode. I don't know how long I ran, or how I found my way back to the cabin. I collapsed in a heap against the door, sucking in great gasps of air. It felt like forever before I could muster the strength to stand and shove the table back into place. That night, I didn't sleep a wink. I clutched a rusty hunting knife my dad had kept under the bed, my eyes glued to the slivers of darkness visible through the gaps in the boarded-up windows. Come morning, I packed my things in a panic. 
I had to get out of here, had to get somewhere populated. Call the cops, or the park rangers, whoever could make sense of this, of that thing. I flung open the cabin door, bags slung over my shoulder, ready to run. But on the porch, there was something waiting for me. A pile of gnawed bones, scattered and bloody. Some pieces I recognized, the delicate bones of a bird, others. Well, I wasn't sure what they were. And right in the center, like a gruesome calling card, was a single white flower. I don't know what type. Nothing that ever grew around here. Terror slammed into me harder than any physical blow. It knew I was here. It was playing with me, toying with me, and the worst part was, I had no idea why and I didn't know what was next. I turned on my heel, slamming the door shut behind me and locking it even though I knew it wouldn't stop whatever that creature was. I ran back through the woods, not towards the road this time, but towards the deepest part of the forest. I needed space. Space where I could at least see the damn thing coming. My legs pumped like pistons, every muscle screaming as I tore through the undergrowth. I wasn't even sure where I was going. Anywhere was better than back there, at that damn cabin with the gnawed bones on the porch, and that, that thing watching from the trees. My breath came in harsh, ragged gasps. Branches whipped back in my face leaving angry red streaks. I stumbled, fell hard, and tasted dirt. I didn't stop, just scrambled back up, spitting out grit, my fear propelling me forward. Hours must have passed, the sunlight dappled and weak through the trees. I collapsed by a rocky outcropping, lungs aflame, vision blurring. I tried to quiet my breathing, tried to listen for any sound of pursuit but all I heard was the frantic thump of my own heart. It was getting dark. I was still deep in the woods, completely lost, and utterly, hopelessly alone. And that's when I saw it. Another flash of off-white, this time moving through the dense undergrowth down the slope. A fresh wave of panic pulsed through me. The damn thing was relentless. It was hurting me, driving me towards something. I refused to be its prey. Refused to become another pile of bones on some goddamn porch. I pushed myself up, legs quivering with exhaustion, and began to climb. The rocky outcropping was steep, but desperation made me scramble upwards with renewed ferocity. Finally, I reached the top and collapsed, gulping in air. Below, the trees stretched out like a sea of green. It took me a moment to spot it. There, at the very edge of my sight, was a sliver of road. Hope surged through me. Too far to see clearly, but close enough to be real. There was an escape, a way out of this nightmare. But then I noticed what was between me and the road. Not ten yards from the base of the rocks, it leaned against a tree. That long, spindly figure, as starkly white as bone in the fading light, just stood there, patient as death itself. It hadn't even been chasing me. It knew I'd come here eventually. I was trapped. Surrounded. It was only a matter of time now. And that's when it hit me, a flash of horrifying clarity. That gnawed deer carcass by the lake, the ribs splayed out. It wasn't a kill. It was bait. The thing had been luring me, drawing me deeper into the woods, isolating me. Why? I wasn't sure, but that sick, twisted display by the water, that felt like a warning. And the thing on the porch, that pile of bones, it was a message. This is what you become. This is what I'll do to you. It didn't want to just kill me. It wanted to break me, make me into some sort of macabre trophy. That realization twisted my insides into knots. Suddenly, my escape didn't seem so important anymore. 
Better to die on my own terms than end up like that. I scanned the rock face, looking for any handholds, a path back down before the thing decided to come and claim its prize. But it was too smooth, too sheer. Nowhere to go but forward. I took one last shaky breath, then rolled to my feet. I stood to my full height, squaring my shoulders. I wouldn't give it the satisfaction of seeing me cower. Come on, you freak! I yelled, the scream echoing through the trees. It felt good, empowering after so long running in fear. For a tense moment, nothing happened. Then that smooth, hairless head tilted ever so slightly, like it was curious. Then it stepped out from behind the tree and started towards me. It didn't run. Just an unhurried, loping glide, eating up the distance with those long, spidery limbs. And then it was close enough for me to see its face better. The smooth skin, the hollow where eyes should be, the faint bulge of a nose. My stomach lurched. It looked incomplete, like a human still under construction, all wrong. There was something so deeply inhuman about it that made my mind recoil. My body, on the other hand, acted on pure animal instinct. I turned and ran, not down the way I'd come, but towards the edge of the rocky outcrop. Behind me, I heard a startled sound, almost a squeak, but I didn't look back. The road below was so close. Salvation, if I could just... Just make the leap. One, two, three steps and then I was at the edge. The ground fell away into a blurred patchwork of green. For a single, heart-stopping moment, I hesitated. This was it. Life or death. Then I thought of those bones on my porch. Thought of that creature standing in the trees, patient and emotionless, waiting for me to break. I couldn't let it win. I closed my eyes and jumped. The air rushed past me. The ground rushed up. And then, impact. Pain exploded through me, and the world went black. They found me three days later. Search and rescue team, alerted by worried neighbors when I didn't show up for work. Broken leg, sprained wrist, concussion. Lucky to be alive, they said. Lucky I didn't break my neck. Lucky I missed those sharp rocks at the bottom. The cops questioned me, of course. I told them about the cabin, about seeing something strange in the woods. I even showed them the pictures of the dead deer. They listened, politely humoring the crazy city guy lost in the forest. No one believed me. I'm not even sure I fully believe it myself sometimes. I went back to the cabin once, after I recovered. Had to grab my things, had to face it. Place was untouched, except for a fresh scattering of gnawed bones on the porch. And a single white flower. I don't know what that thing was. Some kind of cryptid the locals keep hidden? A deranged hermit with a twisted sense of humor? No clue. And deep down, I don't think I want to know. It's easier to file it away as the delusions of a panicked man. But sometimes, at night, when the shadows stretch long and the creaks in my apartment echo just a little too loud, I'm not so sure. I start imagining that lanky, pale figure lurking just beyond the reach of the streetlights, watching and waiting. Maybe I didn't escape after all. Maybe, in some sick way, I ended up exactly where it wanted me. Maybe the real name of that creature isn't some mountain monster or rabid recluse. Maybe it's fear. It was 2019, and I was fresh out of college itching to see the world before getting sucked into a boring nine-to-five. My name's Caleb. I convinced my buddies, Reese and Elliot, 
to pool our graduation money and do a classic cross-country road trip. You know the kind, vintage Mustang convertible, blasting classic rock, the whole deal. First stop, New Orleans. City of jazz, good food, and even better ghost stories. We checked into a cheap little place a few blocks off Bourbon Street, figuring we could walk to the action. It was one of those old, creaky buildings that seemed to sag with the weight of its history. Perfect for the classic Nola charm, right? Wrong. Place felt off from the jump. The lobby had this weird, sickly yellow wallpaper, and a heavy smell of stale cigarettes clung to the air. The guy running the front desk was gaunt, greasy hair slicked back, and gave off a distinctly unfriendly vibe. Figured it was just the New Orleans atmosphere. I was starting to regret not shelling out for a nicer place. The room was straight up depressing. Tiny, dingy, smelled musty as hell. To top it off, the window faced some back alley with boarded up houses. Great view. We decided to head out anyway, grab some of those famous beignets and soak up the nightlife. We spent the next few hours wandering the French Quarter. Had drinks, listened to some music, checked out the voodoo shops with all their weird trinkets, just tourist stuff. Still, couldn't shake that feeling of being watched. It was a humid, sticky night, but a cold shiver kept running down my spine. When we got back to the room, it was with a nagging sense of dread. Reese and Elliot were pretty buzzed and flopped on their beat-up beds, ready to pass out. Me, though, I felt wired. I cracked open the window, hoping for a breeze, but the alley outside was dead still, not a creature in sight. Still, that chill wouldn't leave me. I don't know what time it was when I woke up. Something felt off. Room was dark as pitch and Reese and Elliot were snoring like chainsaws. But I could hear something else. Faint like the drip, drip, drip of a leaky faucet. Took me a minute to realize it was coming from outside the window. I peered out into the alleyway. Nothing. Absolutely dead, not even a stray cat in sight. But the drip, drip, drip persisted. It was starting to get under my skin. The sound led me to look up. And there, perched on the fire escape right outside our window, was the ugliest, most evil-looking dude I'd ever seen. Tall, rail-thin, like skin stretched too tight over bones. But his face, that's what stuck with me, pale, with sunken eyes that glowed faintly in the dark, even the whites seemed to have this black tinge to them. He was staring straight at me, a weird sort of half-smile twisting his lips. Lost something, boy? His voice was raspy, barely a whisper. My skin crawled. I fumbled around for the lamp, and just as it flickered on, he was gone. I bolted to the window. Nothing. No sign of him anywhere. I was shaking like a leaf. Reese mumbled something in his sleep and rolled over but Elliot woke up. Whoa, man, you okay? You look like you've seen a ghost. I must have, because I told him the whole thing. Elliot, bless his soul, didn't laugh. He looked almost as shaken as me. Remember that guy who checked us in? Kind of looked like your creep. My stomach flipped. Let's go check. We crept downstairs. Lobby was pitch black, empty. No one behind the desk. Then we heard it, the drip, drip, drip. But louder. Coming from the back of the building. An old wooden door led into a dingy corridor. Light flickered from an open room at the end. We moved on silent feet. That's when we saw it. The drip was blood. Thick, red, pooling on the floor and in that room was the desk clerk, or what was left of him. Skin flayed, eyes gone, body hanging limp from the ceiling fan. 
Elliot let out a strangled noise. The clerk, or whoever had replaced him, must have heard, because the light in that room winked out, plunging us into darkness. Blind panic took over. We fumbled back, ran the hell out of there, and didn't stop until we were blocks away. Did we call the cops? Hell no. What would you say? Some demon-eyed dude murdered the hotel clerk. No, no, officer, we weren't doing drugs. We just wanted out of there. Next morning, we loaded up the Mustang and got the hell out of Louisiana, putting as many miles as we could between us and that cursed hotel. Never told a soul what we saw, not even our families. Figured no one would believe us anyway. A couple of weeks later, back home, Reese called me, voice shaking. Dude, turn on the news. My heart dropped. There, on the screen, was a mugshot, the desk clerk. Newscaster was going on about a manhunt for an escaped convict who brutally murdered his cellmate. They say he has a rare condition, affects the eyes. Reese trailed off, leaving the rest unspoken. It's been years now, and I still have nightmares about that night. I see that face, those glowing eyes, and the drip, drip, drip of blood echoing in my ears. I never set foot in New Orleans again. It wasn't the ghost that scared me off, turns out the real monsters walk among us. It was the summer of 87, and my life felt like a crappy B-movie. My name's Tyson, fresh out of high school, stuck working a dead-end grocery store job, and trying to figure out how the hell to escape my nowhere town. My dad had split a few months back, not that he was ever around much anyway. So, it was me, Mom and the crushing boredom of living in a town so small the most exciting thing was a new speed bump. Then Ashley walked into the store. Now, I'd seen her around school, but she was one of those girls so out of my league I never even dared look twice. Turns out, she had a summer job too, restocking shelves right across from me. It was like all those dumb rom-coms suddenly spliced themselves into my miserable life. We got to talking, turns out even the pretty girls had problems. Her family had this cabin up in the mountains, some old, rustic thing her grandpa built back in the day, but it needed fixing up. Before I knew it, me and my buddy Marcus were offering our expert handyman services. The pay sucked, but Ashley was there, and hey, a weekend away from home sounded pretty tempting. The drive-up was an adventure in itself. Marcus's beat-up old truck rattled something fierce on the winding mountain roads. The place was remote, like miles down a dirt track, deep in the forest. But the cabin, when we finally stumbled on it, well, it had character, I'll give it that. Ancient logs stacked high, roof patched with mismatched shingles, and a porch swing creaking in the breeze. Didn't exactly scream. Vacation getaway. But it was definitely one of a kind. We started work on Saturday morning. Fixed some loose boards on the porch. Cleared the rain gutters. It was all pretty mundane stuff. Ashley's parents showed up later. Her dad was nice enough. Paid us in cash. And told us to make ourselves at home if we wanted to stay the night. As the sun started dipping down and the woods turned all shadowy. Even Marcus was starting to get creeped out. Ashley, though, she insisted we hang out a while, build a bonfire or something, make a proper evening of it. We're sitting around this crackling fire, telling dumb stories, when I feel it. That prickle at the back of my neck, like I'm being watched. I look up into the trees beyond the circle of firelight, and for a second... I swear I see a pair of eyes gleaming in the dark. Must have been an animal, right? But then it happens again. A faint, rustling sound, 
like footsteps circling us out there in the trees. Marcus notices it too, goes all wide-eyed, and Ashley's smile is starting to waver. Probably just dear, I say, but my voice sounds way too high-pitched, even to me. We try to laugh it off, but the air feels heavy, a wrongness settling in around us. Suddenly, Ashley screams and points. I whip around just in time to see a figure, a tall, lanky shape, slip back into the darkness. Who the hell was that? Marcus yelps, jumping to his feet. I don't know. I mumble, heart pounding against my ribs. Maybe some local messing with us? Only deep down, I know it ain't that. We didn't see him well, but there was something off about him. He moved too quick, too unnatural. We pile into Marcus's truck, headlights slicing through the gloom, not saying a word. Sleep doesn't come easy that night. The cabin creaks and groans, and every rustle outside has me jolting awake. When morning comes, we can't get out of there fast enough. Leave the half-fixed gutters and the rest of that day's pay. It's only as we hit the main road leaving the woods far behind, that I finally relax. Turns out, should have kept that tension a little longer. A couple of days later, Marcus calls me, sounding spooked. Says his cousin up in those mountains just went missing. Hiking alone, they think, but the whole town's out searching, and his aunt is beside herself. Think it could be. Marcus trails off but he doesn't have to finish that sentence. I don't know. I tell him, and it's the truth. Except I have my suspicions. Suspicions of gleaming eyes in the darkness, of tall figures melting into the woods. A month later, they found the cousin's remains. Way off the trail, body torn up. They said it was an animal attack, bear or something, but... I have my doubts. Sometimes, at night, I still hear the echo of those footsteps, circling in the dark. I never went back to those mountains, never saw Ashley again. Sometimes, when the woods around my house rustle in the wind, I think about that weekend. The thing is, the scariest part isn't what I saw. It's what I didn't, the feeling that out there in the wild, beyond the reach of street lights and familiar faces— there are things that don't fit into our neat explanations. Okay, back in 76 I was this fresh out of high school kid working in this dive bar on the outskirts of Phoenix. Think sagged booths, neon signs, and the ever-present smell of stale beer. Name's Terry, by the way. Not exactly a dream gig, but hey, the tips kept me in beer and gas money, and that was all a teenager needed, right? One sticky August night, I'm wiping down the counter, the last few drunks stumbling out the door. Place is finally quiet, when suddenly I hear it. A faint scratching noise, kinda like nails on a chalkboard. I freeze, every muscle tensing up. Hello? I squeak out, voice barely above a whisper. Nothing. Must be some pipe settling, I tell myself, trying to sound tougher than I feel. Then, that scratching again. Louder this time, and coming from the back room. The hair on my arm stands on end. That room's been boarded up for years. Used to be storage. But after a nasty rat problem, the old owner sealed it tighter than a tomb. My heart's pounding like it wants to escape my chest, but I ain't no coward. I grab the nearest half-full beer bottle and tiptoe towards the back room door. With a deep breath, I yank it open, my eyes squinting in the darkness. First, nothing. Then, a flicker of movement in the far corner. My mind races— is that another rat? A bigger one, maybe? I squint, straining to see better, but it ain't no rodent. 
No way. Silhouetted against the dusty window is the figure of a man. A tall man, hunched over with his back to me. He's picking at the rotten wood around the boarded-up window, clawing frantically like a trapped animal. I take a shaky step back, the beer bottle nearly slipping from my sweaty fingers. Hey! I yell louder this time. Who the hell are you? The figure snaps still. Then, slowly, he turns around. Moonlight cuts across his face, and my blood runs cold. That face, it ain't right. All gaunt cheeks, sunken eyes, with a scar running jagged from forehead down past his jawline. He stares back at me with a look that makes me wish I'd never left that bar counter. He lunges at the window, slamming against the boards with a force that shakes the whole damn room. With splinters, his clawed hand reaching through, and for a wild second, I think he's gonna break free, gonna grab my throat. I scream and stumble backward, tripping over one of those beat-up bar stools and landing hard on my tailbone. My attacker lets out a guttural snarl, scrabbling at the window, trying to squeeze through. Panic gives me a jolt of adrenaline. I scramble up, fumbling for the light switch. The room floods with harsh fluorescent light, and the man flinches back, his hands still snagged in the splintered wood. Finally, I get a good look at him. He's rail thin, clothed in rags that hang off him like they were made for someone twice his size. His face is ravaged, skin stretched tight over bone like the face of a goddamn skeleton. And his eyes, they're wild, burning with a rage and hunger that chills me to the core. He rips his hand free, leaving bloody splinters embedded in his skin. I scramble for something, anything, to defend myself with another bar stool, my half-full beer bottle. Hell, I even consider my measly tips. But the man's retreating. He scrambles back into the darkness, the sound of his ragged breathing echoing in the quiet. I'm frozen, too terrified to move, half expecting him to leap from the shadows. After what feels like a lifetime, I gather the courage to creep to the window. It's still boarded up, but there's a gap just wide enough to squeeze through. A trail of blood dots the dusty floor leading out the back of the bar. I follow the drops until they disappear into the scrubby wasteland behind the building. Needless to say, I quit that gig the next day. Never looked back. Cops took my statement, said they'd check it out, but I figured they thought I was drunk, or high, or just messing with them. Never found any sign of the guy, and nobody else ever reported a thing. Still, Sometimes I close my eyes and see his face, all bones and rage. And I remember that scratching sound, and wonder how the hell he got in, or how long he'd been trapped in that room. A couple years later, the old owner finally tore the building down. They say he found something nasty walled up in that back room, something so disturbing he wouldn't tell a soul. Reckon it's best something stay buried, right? But me, I'll never forget that night. I learned the hard way. Some places have a darkness that goes way deeper than dust and old beer. And some sounds, well, once you hear them, you ain't ever the same again. Okay, y'all check this out. Swear on my granddaddy's grave. Every word of this wild story is true. It was back in 94, and I was working as a ranch hand at this massive spread outside of Marfa, Texas. Name's Rusty, by the way. Now, Marfa's out in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by miles of flat, empty desert. Folks talk about those Marfa lights and all those UFO sightings but never figured I'd witness anything weirder than a stray coyote. Boy, was I mistaken. One night, I'm out checking the fences, 
Boss was paranoid some idiot tourists would leave a gate open when I see lights way down by the old windmill. First, I figure it's just headlights from the highway, but they ain't moving, just hanging there in the darkness. I start sweating, and not just from the heat. This ain't no highway car, no way. My heart's pounding like a damn drum solo, but curiosity gets the better of me. I grab a rusty old rifle from the truck and creep closer on foot. The moonlight ain't great, but as I inch nearer, I see the outline of an old pickup parked by the windmill. Now, this part's where it gets real strange. Crouched near the truck's headlights is someone, or something. It's a man, I think, tall and gangly, but he's moving like no human I ever saw, kinda jerky and frantic. He's hunkered down, clawing at the desert sand, digging like a madman. Something about those movements just sends a chill down my spine. I ain't about to announce my presence to whatever the hell that is, not at this point. So, I find this scrubby bush to hide behind, keeping my distance so he don't spot me. The whole time he's digging, the fella's muttering under his breath. At first, it's so soft I can't catch it, but as I get a little closer, I hear snippets. Words like hungry, and lost, and something that sounds like a name, maybe? Makes me think he might be out of his damn mind. Just when I'm thinking maybe I ought to just get the hell out of there, I see him pull something from the hole. It's long and wrapped in what looks like rags, and my stomach twists, because, well, it might be a body. He stumbles up to the truck, clutching this bundle tight. That's when I notice the blood. The whole front of his shirt is soaked, dark stains gleaming in the moonlight. That ain't sweat. And as he throws open the passenger side door, I see it. He tosses the bundle onto the seat, and in the dim glow of the truck, it ain't no bundle, it's a woman. Her face is dead pale, eyes wide open and there's a gash on her throat so deep it looks like she's been half decapitated. I nearly wretch. My whole body is shaking, but I have to move. Dude's about to get in the truck, maybe he ain't noticed me yet. I take aim, but my hands are trembling so bad I can barely hold the damn rifle steady. Suddenly, he whips around, head turning in my direction. His eyes are wild in the darkness filled with a hunger that's pure animal. He's spotted my movement behind the bush. He lets out this guttural snarl that makes my hair stand on end and lunges towards me. I panic, fire the rifle, and the sound blasts through the desert night, sharp as a gunshot. I don't see if I hit him. I'm already running like hell back towards my truck, my legs pumping so hard I can taste blood in my throat. The image of that dead woman, of her murderer's crazed eyes, it's seared into my brain. Don't know if I even hit him. I fumble with the truck keys, hands like ice. I finally get the engine started, tear out of there, tires kicking up dust, and don't stop until I hit the nearest town with a gas station. The whole way back, I'm convinced he's chasing me, hiding in the shadows, watching my every move. Got to the gas station, and the lights make me feel a tiny bit safer. I call the sheriff, stammering out my story even though it sounds insane, even to my own ears. Cops show up, shine flashlights everywhere, find a few shell casings near that bush, but nothing else. They search the whole windmill area, even send folks out the next day with daylight. No body, no sign of the truck, and certainly no trace of that creep. Cops give me that long look, the one that says, Crazy desert guy seeing things. Part of me can't even blame them. Still, deep down, I know what I saw. Don't know who the woman was, or why that lunatic was out there digging a hole for her. Hell, don't even know if she was really dead or just hurt bad. Sometimes I think maybe I hallucinated the whole thing, 
brought on by the heat and the isolation. But then I remember the blood on his shirt, the way his eyes gleamed in the moonlight, and the fear that gripped me tighter than any nightmare could. And I know there's something else out there in that wide, lonely desert, something worse than snakes or coyotes, something evil. All right, this here story's one I ain't never told nobody. It happened back in 87 when I was in college, up in one of those dinky little towns in the Pacific Northwest. You know the kind, all pine trees and flannel shirts. Name's Kyle, by the way. Well, college didn't quite suit me, so I end up living in this rundown trailer park outside town, trying to scrape by on odd jobs and cheap beer. One foggy November night, I'm driving home after a long shift stocking shelves at the local grocery. My crappy truck's rattling something awful, and all I want is something resembling a bed. That's when I see her standing by the side of the road, just a slip of a thing. Now normally, I wouldn't pick up a hitchhiker, especially not alone in the dead of night. But I don't know, it's the way she stands— all hunched shoulders and trembling hands, that makes me pull over. She slides into the passenger seat, barely a word. I try for some casual chit-chat, ask where she's headed, but she just stares straight ahead, clutching her threadbare jacket close. Something about her, those wide eyes, makes my stomach turn. I tell myself it's just the creepy fog making everything seem off. Finally, she speaks, voice a whisper. Take me to the woods, she says, off the main road where nobody goes. Well, this is where any normal person would have bailed. But I'm young, kind of dumb, and those eyes are still drilling into me. I turn off the main road, down some old logging trail, figuring I'll drop her at the end and head home. The deeper into the woods we go, the foggier it gets. The road gets rougher, trees growing thick like they want to swallow us whole. Finally, she tells me to stop. We're in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by those towering pines. Mist clings to everything like cobwebs, making the dark even darker. The girl, her name's Sarah, she finally mentions that. She points through the trees. My home's just through there she says, but there ain't nothing but more trees and fog. My gut is screaming at me to run, but she's already out the door, disappearing into that ghostly mist. I debate just cutting my losses, but something, some stupid sense of chivalry or maybe just plain curiosity, makes me switch off the truck and follow after. The trees are thick, branches dripping, the only sound my own heavy breathing. Then I see it, a flicker of light through the fog. It ain't a house, or a cabin, or nothing you'd expect. It's this, well, it's like a hole dug into the earth, with ragged wooden beams built over it like some makeshift roof. There's a tattered sheet hanging in the entrance, and the dim light of some kind of fire glows from inside. And all around it, the stink... It's a rotten, sickly sweet smell that makes me gag. My mind's starting to piece things together. The terrified girl, the secrecy, the middle-of-nowhere shack. Something bad is happening here, and I shouldn't have gotten involved. But before I can turn tail and run, Sarah emerges from the entrance. And that's when I lose it. See, she's carrying something wrapped in a filthy blanket something heavy. My brain starts shouting, body, it's a body, run now. Still, I'm frozen, like a deer caught in the headlights. Can you help? Sarah asks. Her eyes are wide, pleading. Please. That single word snaps me out of it. I turn and run, stumble blindly back through the trees. Branches whip my face, fog chokes my lungs 
but I don't look back until I reach the truck. I gun it out of there, tires spitting up gravel. Don't stop until I hit the main road. Don't breathe easy until I see the lights of town. In the rearview mirror, the fog swallows up that logging trail like it never existed. Next morning, I'm at the sheriff's station. I know how crazy it sounds, telling all this to some bored small-town deputy. He humors me, sends some guys out to check the area, but they find nothing, not a trace. Sarah, the shack, all gone, like some kind of nightmare vanished with the morning light. Some folks in town, they heard the story, figured I'd been drinking, or worse, that I made the whole thing up for attention. But I swear, every damn word is true. I saw those eyes, I smelled that rot in the woods. Now, I don't go off the beaten path much, not anymore. And at night, when the fog rolls in, I remember that shack, that girl, the bundle she carried. And I wonder, what the hell was buried out there? And am I lucky I didn't stay to find out? Or is there some darkness out there that just missed me that night? Nineteen seventy two on the outskirts of Flagstaff, Arizona. Let me tell you, moving in with your best friend sounds like a great plan until you do it. Turns out, when you cram two dudes, a hyperactive mutt, and all our crap into a tiny, rundown cabin, it's less animal house, and more like a cramped, smelly zoo. I'm Casey, by the way. This whole mess started with me getting fed up living with my aunt after high school. Ethan's idea of fun was the great outdoors, so when his dad offered up their old hunting shack near Flagstaff, we jumped on it. So here we are, miles from civilization, surrounded by those towering pines and the dry desert air. Gorgeous, sure, but also kinda lonely. The closest sign of life is old Bob and his junkyard a couple miles down the road. Gotta get stuff, we go to him. Need your car fixed on the cheap, he's your guy. Honestly, Bob's a lifesaver out here. One scorching afternoon, I'm chopping wood. Ethan's off hiking the dog, Rusty, at his heels. Every swing of the axe makes me sweatier, and with that buzz of flies, man... I'm about to call it quits. Then I hear it, a sort of rustling coming from the trees behind the cabin. Rusty hears it too, for bristling as he growls low in his throat. What is it, boy? I say, peering into the shadows. Just a squirrel or something? But then I see a figure step out from between the trees. Man, tall as a beanpole and skinny as one too. He's wearing faded overalls and a battered straw hat pulled so low it hides his face. Something about him gives me the creeps, the way he stands stock still, just staring at me. Hey there, I call out, trying to sound friendly. Can I help you? He doesn't respond. Doesn't even move. Uh, you lost or something? I try again, sweat rolling down my neck. It's like a switch flips. Suddenly, the guy starts walking toward me. Real stiff, like his joints don't bend right. Now Rusty's barking his head off, hackles raised. I reach for the axe and yell louder. Hey, stop right there! Get off my property! But he keeps coming. That's when I notice his hands. They're big, gnarled, with long, dirty fingernails. And the smell, something rotten and sharp hangs in the air around him. Panic kicks in. I snatch up the axe, my heart pounding so hard I can hear it over Rusty's barking. I said back off. He ignores me, taking another slow step. And that's when I see a glint of metal in his hand. A knife. Rusty, attack! I scream, but the dog whimpers and backs away tail tucked. Fear floods through me. 
This guy, he ain't right. I swing the axe wildly, forcing him to pause. That's the moment I choose to run. I turn and sprint towards the cabin, Rusty bolting at my side. Glancing back, I see the man lunging after me, moving faster than I'd have thought possible. We reach the door, and I fumble with the key, yelling at Rusty to get inside. Just as I shove the door open, I feel his hand on my shoulder, those long, dirty fingers digging into my skin, and then I'm inside, slamming the door shut, fumbling for the lock. Outside, I can hear pounding, heavy bangs against the wood. Rusty whimpers in the corner, and I grab a kitchen knife, hands trembling. Ethan! I yell, but there's no answer. I peer through the grimy window and see him still at the door, pounding relentlessly. Then he stops, tilting his head as if listening. And then he starts to walk around the side of the cabin. There's only one window back there, facing into Ethan's room. My stomach churns. No, 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 I mutter, scrambling towards the back of the cabin. I trip over a chair leg and nearly lose the knife, heart screaming in my chest. Reaching his room, I peek around the corner. The window's shattered. Glass crunches under my feet as I step closer and see streaks of blood on the floor. Then a strangled cry from outside, Ethan's voice. I freeze. He's out there with Ethan. And all I have is this stupid kitchen knife. My mind races. Ethan's in trouble, and I gotta do something. I can't just cower in here. Gripping the knife, I step away from the window. Gotta think, gotta be smart. There's a back door through the kitchen. If I can circle around the cabin, maybe distract that freak long enough for Ethan to get away. I creep back into the living room, the only sound my own shallow breathing. Rusty whimpers in a corner near the door, where the pounding has stopped. An eerie kind of silence. Tiptoeing to the kitchen, I peer out the back window. Empty. But is he waiting? Hiding? The thought makes my skin crawl. Okay, here we go. I take a deep breath, trying to quiet my pounding heart. Then I open the back door and step outside. It's crazy hot with the sun beating down. The silence feels heavy, like the air right before a storm. Slowly, I edge around the corner of the cabin, holding the knife ready. As I round the front porch, I freeze. He's standing near the axe, which is buried in a tree stump. That long, dirt-streaked hand is gripping the handle. He's trying to pull it free. That's when I see Ethan. My best friend is sprawled on the ground nearby, completely still. A wave of nausea hits me. Ethan! I yell, but there's no response. The freak turns, his straw hat casting a deep shadow over his face. He tilts his head slightly, like a bird studying me. The sight of him sends a jolt of fury through me. Roaring, I charge at him, the knife held high. He yanks the axe free and hefts it, ready to meet my attack. We circle each other, me with my little kitchen knife, him with that rusty axe. I'm fueled by fear, rage, and a primal need to protect my friend. He lunges at me, and I just barely dodge the swing of the axe. It embeds in the porch railing, and for a second, he's stuck. I seize the chance, stabbing with the knife. He cries out, his hand clutching the wound. Black blood leaks from his fingers, staining his threadbare overalls. I pull away, sickened yet determined. The moment of surprise has worn off, and now he's mad. He rips the axe from the wood and stalks towards me, a snarl twisting his thin lips. I backpedal desperate. I stumble, tripping over a root. The knife flies from my hand, and he's on me in an instant, the axe raised high. 
I closed my eyes, bracing for the blow. And then, a gunshot. It echoes through the trees, loud and sudden. The man jolts, dropping the axe. His body jerks, and then he collapses to the ground, a dark stain spreading across the back of his overalls. My eyes fly open. Out from the trees steps old Bob, a rifle in his hands. Rusty charges forward, barking furiously at the fallen man. You boys okay? Old Bob asks, jogging towards us. Saw that feller skulking around. Ain't never seen him before. I run over to Ethan, heart pounding like a drum. Get help! I yell to Bob. Hands trembling, I check Ethan's pulse. It's weak but steady. He's alive. Bob rushes off, and I slump to the ground beside Ethan, a wave of relief washing over me. The cops and an ambulance arrive in what feels like hours. It's chaos. Paramedics tend to Ethan. Cops question me, and Bob keeps circling, repeating. Never seen no one like that before. They never caught up with the guy. The cops find his empty camp a few miles back in the woods, but no sign of him. Just some dried blood and a stack of newspapers. Turns out, there'd been a string of break-ins at cabins, thefts from stores, people seeing a strange figure lurking around. The papers called him the Flagstaff Wanderer. They chalked it up to a homeless guy gone off his rocker. But I can't shake the feeling there was something else to it. Something dark and inhuman. The way he looked at me, with those empty eyes. How he smelled just wrong. Ethan made a full recovery, but we never went back to that cabin. Old Bob sold it off. Every time I drive through the area, see those towering pines, I get a shiver down my spine. And when I hear a rustling in the woods, I swear I can still see that straw hat and those long, dirty fingers. I guess a part of me still wonders, if old Bob hadn't shown up that day, what would have happened? And sometimes, late at night, I think I hear a tapping at my window, like someone trying to get in, and I almost expect to see the face of, was it Jake? That seems right. Jake, the Flagstaff Wanderer. Nineteen eighty three, upstate New York, near the Finger Lakes. Okay, when your landlord kicks you out for throwing one too many parties, couch surfing is, admittedly, not the most glamorous. Then again, I figured it was better than heading back to my parents with my tail between my legs. My name's Tyson, by the way. College dropout trying to figure this whole life thing out. This particular week has me crashing with my cousin, Marcus, and his roommate, Cal. Now, their apartment above a garage isn't exactly spacious, but hey, the rent's right. Cal's cool, always laid back, with this shaggy surfer vibe even though we're nowhere near a beach. It's a little cramped, a little messy, but I tried to keep out of their way. One Friday night, they're both out so I decide to raid the fridge and finally catch up on some reading. Halfway through my third beer, I start to hear music blasting from the old barn behind the house. Now, that's odd. These guys live at the end of a dirt road in the middle of nowhere. Neighbors aren't exactly a thing out here. Curiosity wins. Grabbing another beer, I head out back to investigate. The barns all lit up, music even louder. Some song I don't recognize, heavy on the bass, kind of, sinister? I figure maybe Marcus or Cal decided to throw a party and didn't invite me. A little rude, but hey, I can't get mad at a good time. Pushing open the barn door, I'm hit with the smell of musty hay and something, else. Something sickly sweet, like rotting meat. My nose wrinkles. 
Inside, the place is decked out with flashing lights, a makeshift dance floor. It's mostly empty, save for a few guys swaying drunkenly, clearly wasted. But what hits me first, silhouetted in the blinking strobes, is the shape hanging from the rafters. At first glance, I assume it's a Halloween decoration gone seriously wrong. But as my eyes adjust, the horror sinks in. It's a body. A man, strung upside down, skin pale as moonlight. And something's been at him, torn chunks of, it looks nod, almost. A wave of nausea washes over me, the beer in my hand suddenly feeling like lead. I turn to run, to find Marcus, call the cops, do anything, but trip over a beer can. The clatter echoes in the silence. The music has stopped. Slowly I look up. Standing there, in the doorway, is a dude. Tall, skinny as a rake. Wearing just these ragged jeans, his bare chest, it's covered in dried blood. His face is all in shadow, but even in the dim light, his eyes gleam like an animal's. You shouldn't be here, he says, his voice low and raspy. The guy takes a step towards me. I scramble backward, the panic rising like a scream in my throat. He advances steady, unhurried. Help! I yell out, my voice hoarse. But out here, with no houses in sight, who's gonna hear me? He's almost on me now. I see his hand, long, filthy fingernails curled like claws, reaching out for me. I'm gonna be like that guy hanging from the ceiling. My mind flashes with gruesome newspaper headlines. College student found mauled. Tears sting my eyes. This is it. This is how I end. Right here, in this stinking barn. That's when I hear a shout from behind me. It's Marcus and Cal, bursting into the barn. Ty! What the hell are you? Marcus cuts himself off with a gasp when he sees the body in the rafters. The skinny guy whirls around, startled. Cal, bless his heart, doesn't hesitate. He grabs a pitchfork leaning against the wall and charges, forcing the stranger backward. Seizing my chance, I scramble to my feet. My legs are shaking but I manage to stagger towards the barn door. Marcus is yelling at me as I stumble past, but I don't stop. I'm running blind, back towards the house, tears streaming down my face. Don't look back, don't look back. The mantra repeats in my head as I sprint through the darkness. I reach the porch and pound frantically on the door, screaming for them to let me in. Finally, I hear the lock click open and burst inside. I collapse on the couch, sobbing now, big gasping breaths. Marcus and Cal appear, both pale and wide-eyed. Where'd he go? I manage to gasp out between ragged breaths. Did you get him? We lost him in the trees, Marcus says grimly. He glances nervously out the window, half expecting the guy to appear in the darkness. Who the hell was that, Ty? Why'd he have a, uh... I... I don't know. I choke out. I just heard the music and... It takes a while to calm down enough to explain everything. Marcus calls the cops. They show up, take our statements, examine the barn. The body, it's gone. They search the woods but find nothing, not even a trace of the dude. Cops don't really believe us, figure we were hallucinating on drugs or something. They warn us against underage drinking and leave. The next day, we all scour the woods again. Nothing. It's like the whole nightmare vanished. Except, I find a beer can by the place where I stumbled upon the guy. The same brand I was drinking. Okay, so 1995. 
I'm fresh out of high school, and while everyone else jets off to college, I'm waiting tables in my crummy hometown of Asheville, Ohio. Name's Brianna, by the way, but everyone calls me Bree. Living with my folks isn't a dream, but it beats racking up student debt. My only escape is hanging out with my bestie, Jen, who works at the dusty old record shop downtown. This Tuesday, we're closing up the shop, the smell of old vinyl and stale coffee hanging in the air. Jen's behind the counter, blasting Nirvana, looking angsty as usual. Ugh, can't wait for this day to end, she grumbles, tossing her messy blonde hair back. Me neither, I yawn. Double shift tomorrow and then my folks are having that stupid dinner party. We lock up tight when a beat-up pickup rumbles to a stop out front. A guy hops out. Tall, wearing a faded Metallica shirt with his shaggy brown hair sticking out every which way. Now, Asheville doesn't exactly attract heartthrobs. I glance at Jen, raising an eyebrow, and she smirks. Well, hello there, she whispers, loud enough for him to hear. He walks in a jingling coming from his loose jeans. At the counter, he leans close, his voice a low drawl. I'm looking for something special. Heard y'all have some old bootlegs. Jen practically melts. We might, she purrs back. What kind of bands you into? They talk music, mostly heavy metal stuff I can't stand. This guy, he definitely ain't from around here. There's a flicker of something in his eyes, a kind of intensity that gives me a little shiver. After about twenty minutes, Jen gives him the special stuff from the back room and he pays cash, a big wad of it. As he turns to leave, he throws me a half-smile. Hey, thanks for the help, he says, and his voice is surprisingly gentle. We both watch him go, the jingle fading as he drives off into the dusk. Whoa, Jen breathes. He was intense. I just nod, still feeling that little shiver down my spine. That night, I'm tossing and turning. Something about that dude has lodged itself in my brain. Jen's words echo in my head, intense. That's it. In a town like Asheville, he was like a lightning strike. Next evening, I'm dragging after my double shift. Folks' dinner party is in full swing, loud, stuffy, the smell of pot roast making me nauseous. I decide to sneak out back for some fresh air. Our backyard butts up against a patch of woods, and there's a break in the old fence I used to crawl through as a kid. I step through. The moon casts long shadows, and the crickets are loud. A twig snaps behind me, and I whip around, heart pounding. Whoa there, it's just me. It's him. The dude from the record shop. He's leaning casually against a tree, that same faint smile on his face. What, how did you? I stammer, my voice barely above a whisper. Small town. He chuckles, the sound low and rich in the quiet night. Saw your car out front, figured I'd wait. That jingle gets louder as he steps out of the shadows. Turns out, it's keys on a chain hanging from his belt loop. A cold dread starts in the pit of my stomach. You shouldn't be here. I force out, trying to edge back towards the fence. And leave without saying goodbye? He takes another step closer. Especially after we had such a nice time yesterday. That was work. I manage. I have to get back. He's blocking my path now. I can see the glint in his eyes in the moonlight. It's not friendly anymore. See, I collect things, he says, his voice smooth but laced with something cold. Rare a piece, old coins, and sometimes I find something extra special. Like you? And then he lunges. I freeze. Every instinct screams at me to run, 
but it feels like my legs are rooted to the ground. He reaches for me, his hand outstretched, those long, dirty fingernails just inches away from my skin. Come with me, he purrs, and there's a hunger in his voice that makes me want to vomit. His fingers brush my arm, and it's like an electric shock. I jerk back, and that seems to break the spell. I turn and bolt, tearing through the woods, branches whipping at my face. I hear him behind me, crashing through the undergrowth, his ragged breaths echoing through the trees. He's gaining on me. The fence is in sight, and I scramble for the gap. I almost make it, but then his hand clamps around my ankle, dragging me back. I fall hard, my chin hitting the dirt. His laughter rings out, cruel and triumphant. Silly girl. You can't outrun destiny. He hauls me back towards the trees, his grip bruising my skin. Then, a noise, shouting voices, flashlights cutting through the darkness. It's my dad and some of his dinner party buddies, probably missing their card game, coming to see where the heck I've gotten to. The dude freezes. It's enough time for me to twist, kicking out with all my strength. I connect with his knee, and he roars in pain, releasing his grip. I scramble to my feet and run for the house, not daring to look back. Reaching the back porch, I collapse against the railing, gasping for breath. Dad and the guys burst from the woods, looking confused and worried. Bree? What in God's name? Are you all right? Dad stammers. There was someone in the woods. I managed to get out my voice raw. They search, but find nothing. No footprints, no sign of struggle. Dad insists I must have imagined it, been spooked by the dark. Maybe they're right. But I swear I felt his breath on my neck, heard his voice echoing that word, destiny. The next few days are a blur. The police get involved, but turn up nothing. No matching reports of missing persons, no suspicious cars spotted around town. It's like the whole thing was a bad dream. But it wasn't. I know what I saw, what I felt. Jen stops by, her face pale. Did you hear? Old Mrs. Simmons, the one down the street? She found some stuff in her backyard, like ripped up clothes. And they think, they think it might be blood. A chill runs down my spine. We both know, someone else encountered that guy. And unlike me, they weren't so lucky. I never go out back at night anymore. And whenever I hear keys jingling, I tense up. Asheville suddenly feels so much smaller, more claustrophobic. Like there's a predator lurking in the shadows, someone who collects trophies. Sometimes, when I think of that night, I try to convince myself it was all some hallucination. But then I remember his eyes in the moonlight, cold and calculating. And I remember his words, that spine-chilling word, destiny. Maybe he got the wrong girl that night. Maybe he thinks we have unfinished business. Maybe he's right. Maybe he's still out there, waiting for me like in some cheesy horror movie. And maybe his name is Keith, because I think I finally figured out why he reminded me of Keith Campbell. The quiet guy from a few grades above, always a little, off. The one who disappeared a few years back. No body ever found. I moved to rural Nevada in 2019, just an hour outside of Reno. Needed a change, and my dad had a place way out in the desert he was barely using. It wasn't fancy, but I was a broke artist at the time. And hey, it's not like there was a ton to do out there anyway. So, I loaded up my old Subaru and embraced the quiet. 
The place itself was nothing special. A basic single story with a dusty yard and a view filled with scrub and sagebrush. I painted, listened to podcasts, and learned enough basic survival skills to not immediately die in the wilderness. Honestly, I even got into it for a while, the solitude, the pace of life. Then, it was maybe six months in, during those brutal summer months, that things started to get a little off. Little things. First, my internet started getting choppy, especially at night. Figured it was the summer heat messing with something. Then, the house seemed to creak and settle more than usual, especially after dark. At one point, I swore I saw a flicker of movement out by the generator, but when I went to check, nothing was there. I blamed it on the heat, the stress, told myself it was desert wildlife, my nerves getting to me. After all, I had spent years crammed in tiny city apartments. It was an adjustment. A little paranoia was normal, right? But one night, I couldn't ignore it anymore. I woke up to a thud, loud enough to shake the whole house. Sitting straight up in bed, I felt my heart thump a mile a minute. It didn't sound like the wind or the usual nighttime sounds. It sounded big. I grabbed my phone, ready to call 911, but then froze. What would I even tell them? A weird thumping noise in the middle of nowhere? They'd laugh me off the phone. My thoughts were racing. Then I heard something worse. Scratching. Scraping. Like something was slowly circling the house. Each creak of the floorboards outside my locked bedroom door sent a chill down my spine. Adrenaline flooding my system. I did the only thing my trembling body would let me. I hid under the covers like a little kid. Okay, Callie. I muttered under my breath. You just need to get to your car. That's all. The scraping noises grew louder, closer, almost right outside the window. Then silence. Taking a deep, shaky breath, I peeked out from under the covers. The room was cloaked in darkness, my only light coming from the dim glow of my phone screen. I had to move. Tiptoeing to the window, I cautiously peeked out from behind the curtain. Nothing. Absolutely nothing outside. That was more or less the pattern. Strange sounds, unsettling moments, then absolutely nothing. I told myself that I was going crazy. I'd call my dad, and he'd tell me the desert was messing with my head. But I'd only be half convinced. A few weeks later, it escalated. It was a sweltering day, the wind kicking up dust devils outside. I was painting in the little shed out back when I heard a sharp thud behind me. Whirling around, I saw a figure in the doorway, blocking the piercing afternoon light. He was tall and broad, a ragged a hat casting a shadow over his features. His hands were shoved deep in the pockets of his dirty jeans. I froze my paintbrush slipping from my fingers with a clatter. Who are you? I rasped. My throat was sandpaper dry. He just stood there, staring. A long, chilling silence passed, punctuated by the distant howl of the wind. Loss, he finally rasped. His voice was coarse and used. His words hung in the dusty air. I didn't move. He couldn't be dangerous, could he? Just some poor guy stranded out in the desert. Can I help? I ventured, voice still trembling slightly. The figure took one slow step forward into the shed. I saw scuff boots, faded jeans, and a flannel shirt, the sleeves rolled up muscular forearms. That's when I saw it. A glint of metal in his back pocket. My stomach dropped. I, he started, but I was already scrambling back, knocking over my easel. Look, I, I have water inside. And some snacks. I can bring it out, just, just stay there. 
his head tilted slightly, almost amused. Now why would I do that? I didn't answer. Instead, I scrambled past him, knocking him slightly as I ran for the shed's back door. Before he could grab me, I slammed it shut behind me, fumbling with the rusty lock. My panicked mind couldn't think fast enough. I needed to get to the house, lock myself in, and call for help. But of course, my phone was useless out here. I heard the shed door creak open as I sprinted across the dusty yard, boots slipping on loose gravel. Reaching the house, I tore open the front door, slamming it shut behind me. Hands trembling, I shoved the ancient deadbolt into place. He was going to follow me, wasn't he? I pressed my back to the door, listening. It was silent except for my frantic breathing. Then I heard footsteps slow and deliberate. He was taking his time. He wasn't panicked or worried. He was sure of himself, of what he was planning to do. The footsteps came to a stop just outside the door. And there he waited. I waited too, legs going numb, eyes fixated on the flimsy lock. Hours seemed to stretch by marked only by the dull thumping of my own pulse in my ears. As the sun began to sink below the horizon, casting long shadows that stretched towards the house, I knew I couldn't stay inside forever. I had to do something, anything. Peering out the grimy window again, I couldn't see anyone. Creeping outside, my heart in my throat, I cautiously looked around. Nothing. Had he given up? He seemed like the patient sort. Like he knew I was trapped with no way to escape and he had all the time in the world. I glanced towards my car, imagining myself sprinting to it, keys already out, but there was no use. He'd catch me before I got halfway across the yard. My mind raced. There must be something I could use. I remembered my dad mentioning keeping a small toolbox somewhere in the shed. With newfound determination, I dashed back inside the house and scanned the dusty shelves. Jackpot. A small, slightly rusted hammer nestled behind some cans of old paint. I clutched the handle tightly. This was ridiculous, using a hammer as a weapon. It was all I had. I kept telling myself to think, to find a way out. Maybe if I could damage his car while he was distracted? Would he chase after me on foot, giving me a chance to escape? It was a flimsy plan, but staying here was a death sentence. I tiptoed back outside, hammer in hand, scanning the landscape around the house. Where had he gone? Was he hiding, waiting for me? Was I just walking straight into his trap? My thoughts were a tangled mess, but I forced my feet forward. Rounding the back of the house, I saw him. He was sitting on a pile of rocks near the old generator, casually sharpening a knife with a stone. It wasn't just any knife. It was a hunting knife, the kind with a serrated edge and a wicked curve at the tip. A chill ran through me. He wasn't just some passerby. This had been planned. My hands were sweaty now, and my grip on the hammer tightened. I had to take a chance. Creeping silently toward his back, I tried to get as close as possible before striking. You know, his voice cut through the quiet desert air. This isn't smart. Not smart at all. My heart sank. He knew I was there. I'd never get a clean hit now. Why are you doing this? I forced myself to speak. My voice trembled less than I expected. That's a long story, darling. Maybe I'll tell you over a nice dinner, inside. I realized I was shaking now, hammer raised limply beside my leg. He wasn't in a hurry. He was toying with me. You'll have to find me first, I said, my voice raspy and defiant. He turned slowly, 
a twisted smile on his face. Don't worry. I will. That's when I ran. Like a scared rabbit, I bolted toward the scrubland that stretched for miles in every direction. I heard him behind me, his heavy boots pounding on the dirt, but I didn't look back. I ran until my lungs were on fire, until the sun blazed red and the stars began to dot the darkening sky. He didn't follow me. I stumbled into a gully and collapsed, chest heaving. That's where I stayed all night, huddled in the shadows, praying that he wouldn't find me. When the first light of dawn crept over the horizon, I forced myself to stand looking back towards the house. I saw smoke rising from the chimney. He hadn't left. He was waiting. I never went back. I couldn't even bring myself to call the police. I knew they'd think I was crazy. Instead, I just packed what few things I could carry and abandoned my father's place. To this day, I don't know how I survived. Or how he found me. The cops say I'm lucky. Most girls like me, alone in the middle of nowhere, become another statistic, a case that goes cold. They say his name is Nathaniel something. Maybe they've even caught him by now, linked him to disappearances all over the Southwest. I try not to think about it, about how close I came. I focus on building a new life. But sometimes in the quiet hours, I look over my shoulder, wondering if I'll ever see his face again. It was 1978 when I took that road trip across the country. Fresh out of school, a beat-up 72 Impala, and a whole lot of bad poetry scribbled into a worn-out notebook. I figured it was the perfect setup for figuring out what to do with my life. California beckoned with its beaches and boho vibes, but somewhere around the Arizona border, I realized I was craving a different kind of isolation. That's how I landed near a dusty little town called Hopewell, New Mexico. There wasn't much there, a gas station, a diner run by a woman named Ma who made a mean cherry pie, and not a whole lot else. But that was kind of the appeal. I rented an old trailer on the edge of town, the kind that had seen better days, and figured I'd hole up and finally write that novel I'd been dreaming up since high school. The days settled into a kind of peaceful monotony. I'd write until my eyes went blurry, then hike through the scrubland, imagining I was the main character in some sunbaked western. But it wasn't long before that peaceful bubble started to crack. First, it was the sounds. Every night, I'd hear a rhythmic thumping echoing through the otherwise silent desert. Too loud to be an animal, too slow to be anything natural. It kept me up late, my heart pounding a mile a minute. I joked to myself that it must be aliens, but that nervous laughter hid a nagging sense of dread. Then there was that day on a hike. I was a few miles out, exploring an old, overgrown mine shaft, when I found it, a single, worn work boot lying in the dirt. It was old, but not that old. Someone out there, someone who hadn't used the trails. It made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. After that, I was too jittery to venture far, sticking to walks into town for supplies. I started carrying a pocket knife I found in a drawer of the trailer, just in case. Everyone at the diner seemed the same ma was still as cheerful as ever, the regulars still drinking their terrible coffee and gossiping. Yet, there was a tightness in my chest that wouldn't loosen. A few weeks passed like that, the thumping, the unease, the gnawing feeling that something was just off. Then, one morning, it all came crashing down. I was at Ma's, sipping stale coffee while she clucked over me like a mother hen. Out of habit, I was idly scanning the dusty parking lot through the window when I saw it, 
a battered pickup truck I'd never seen before. It was old and rusted, the kind that had seen some mileage, and not just on roads. Then he stepped out of the truck. I remember it so clearly, like a freeze frame in a movie. He was tall, with a kind of wiry strength that comes from hard living. His weather jeans looked like they'd been slept in for a week, and his faded flannel shirt couldn't hide the bulge of what I knew was a gun on his hip. He wore a ragged ball cap pulled low, shadowing his eyes, but I could still feel the intensity of his gaze from across the parking lot. He didn't smile. He just stood there, staring at the diner. Ma, I whispered, a sick feeling rising in my gut. Who's that? She glanced across and her smile faltered. Don't know him, she said, her voice quieter than usual. New in town, maybe. But it didn't feel like that. It felt like he'd been waiting. I left the diner, the hairs on my arms standing up. I swear I felt his eyes on me the whole walk back to my trailer. Every shadow seemed to conceal a threat, and every creak of the old trailer sounded like footsteps. I barricaded the door with a rickety wooden chair, pathetic, probably, and sat down at my writing desk, the half-finished pages of my novel mocking me. And it was just as the sun dipped below the horizon— painting the desert in streaks of fiery orange, that I heard it. Footsteps. Slow, deliberate, approaching the trailer. The rhythmic thumping from the nights before was gone, replaced by this awful certainty. My pocket knife felt useless, ridiculous. I wasn't a fighter. I was a kid pretending to be a writer, miles from anyone who could help. The footsteps stopped right outside. A long, agonizing silence hung in the air. And then he knocked. Three sharp raps on the flimsy metal door. My heart was jackrabbiting in my chest. I didn't answer, couldn't even bring myself to breathe too loudly. I just sat there, frozen, waiting for whatever would come next. The silence after those knocks felt deafening. Part of me wanted to peek out the dusty window, to see if he was still there. But some instinct, maybe the same one that told me this guy was bad news, kept me rooted in my chair. He knew I was in there. I could feel it. He knocked again, louder this time. Open up! His voice rasped from the other side of the door. It sounded rough and used. My mind raced. Did I dare try to talk to reason? Or would opening the door just seal my fate? Before I could decide, there was a scrape of metal against metal and a low curse from outside. I held my breath. Was he picking the lock? Had I even locked it in my panic? My hands started to shake. He was going to get in. And then, what? The answer came sooner than I expected. I heard an earth-shattering bang, and the whole trailer swayed violently. The chair I'd propped against the door flew backward, clattering against the wall. He'd kicked the door in. I stumbled to my feet, my mind running in frantic circles. There was a small back window, but was I fast enough? Even if I got out, where would I run? He'd catch me out in the open like a damn jackrabbit under a hawk's eye. I couldn't hide forever, not out here. He was inside now. I heard him shuffling about, his movements eerily calm amongst the chaos he'd created. Desperation seized me. There had to be somewhere, anywhere, I could hide. I looked around wildly, my eyes finally landing on the old trunk under the bed. Could I? It was just big enough. Quietly, I crawled under the bed. I barely breathed as I wedged myself into the trunk, dragging the lid down as far as I could. It closed with a muted click, and I was plunged into darkness. The air inside was stale, musty, barely enough to keep the panic at bay. 
I heard him rummaging through my meager possessions, muttering under his breath. I could only imagine what he must be thinking probably that I was some pathetic loser, easy prey. Moments stretched into agonizing minutes. I held my breath until my chest burned, then took tiny, silent gasps for air. My knees were pressed tight to my chest, my heart hammering like a drum solo. He had to know I was here, had to feel the fear radiating off me. Yet he kept searching, as if taunting me, drawing out the suspense. Then silence again. Had he left, or was he waiting? Every muscle in my body tensed. I willed myself to calm down, to think. Maybe I could make a break for it, distract him long enough to get my pocket knife, maybe even get a good cut in. It was a long shot, but better than waiting to die. Just as I was about to bolt out from my hiding place, I heard him take a slow, deliberate step. Then another. And another. He was coming closer. The trunk creaked as his weight settled near the lid. My breath hitched in my throat. He knew exactly where I was. It felt like hours passed as we both held steady. Then he spoke. Come out now, and I might make this quick. His voice was right above me, cold and flat. Every fiber of my being screamed at me to run, but something held me back. I heard him scoff, a dark chuckle echoing in the confines of the trunk. It was the last sound I heard before the lid snapped open, light flooding my hiding spot. He yanked me out, his grip like iron on my arm. I scrambled backward, my head smacking against the wall. Dazed, I looked up at him. His face was in shadow, but even in the dimness, I could make out the deep lines etched around his eyes, the hard set of his jaw. He'd been through some things, this one seen darkness. Suddenly it clicked, a name drifting up from the recesses of news reports idly skimmed in diners and whispers picked up in small towns. Jonah Carter. They called him the Roadside Reaper, a drifter linked to disappearances and abandoned cars from Texas all the way out west. And he had me. It was back in 1962, and I was working as a security guard at a warehouse down in Key West, Florida. Not the most exciting gig, but it paid all right for a guy like me. My name's Harvey, and that warehouse held everything under the sun. Appliances, furniture, electronics. You name it, we probably had it. The night shifts were mine. Quiet just the way I liked them. But one night, routine went right out the window. It was stormy out, and something went wrong with the power. Whole place went dark as pitch. At first, I figured a blown transformer or something, but when I went to check the fuse box, I saw that every last switch had been flipped. Creepy, yeah, but I chalked it up to an electrical surge. The backup generator kicked in soon enough, but I still had a bad feeling. This place was huge, and I was the only one on duty. Made me damn good at imagining shadows twisting into nightmares. I did my rounds with my flashlight, trying to shake off the jitters. I had just passed the appliance section when I heard it, a whisper of movement, like someone had stepped on cardboard. Who's there? I barked out, voice trembling a little. Nothing. Just the sound of heavy rain against the metal roof. I shone my flashlight around, but everything seemed to be in order. Still, that whisper stuck with me. I started towards the back, my heart pounding a mile a minute. That's when I saw the boxes. In the furniture aisle, a stack of them had been knocked over, some torn open. It looked like an animal had been through there. Raccoon, I muttered, trying to calm myself down, 
but deep down, I was thinking about those stories of wild alligators getting into warehouses down here. I was about ready to call it a night and blame the mess on storm damage, when something moved fast and big right in front of me. My beam of light caught a tall, dark figure. A man, I thought for a moment, but something about the way he moved, wrong. Too fast, too hunched over. I raised the flashlight to get a better look. That's when it lunged at me. Its face, Jesus, its face. I can't even describe it properly. Thin, long, too many teeth in a mouth that stretched far too wide. Its eyes were big, round, reflecting the light. I stumbled backward, screaming, and that thing hissed, a sound like nails on a chalkboard. I lost my footing, and as I hit the ground, I saw it leap over me, bounding away into the darkness. Trembling, I got back up, shone my flashlight around wildly. It was gone. No sign of it except for the torn boxes. But I knew it was still there. It was watching me. I didn't stick around to find out what it wanted. I grabbed my keys and ran. Left the warehouse wide open, didn't care about my job, I just wanted to get out of there, get away from whatever the hell that thing was. I drove straight to the police station, but I doubt they believed a word I said. Some of them even smirked. But one older fella, Officer Reynolds, he got real serious, took a lot of notes said they'd look into it. I didn't get back to my place until dawn. Didn't sleep much after. I knew that thing, whatever it was, could find me. I spent the next few days jumpy, looking over my shoulder everywhere. I even called up an old buddy in Tampa, begged for a place to crash until things calmed down. And then, right when I thought maybe I was going crazy, I saw the news report. A warehouse worker a few towns over, found dead. They said it was an animal attack, but there were photos. The guy's body was, it was mangled, unrecognizable. And I had a pretty good idea what kind of animal had gotten him. I left without a goodbye note, hit the road north. Didn't stop until I couldn't smell the salt air anymore. I never saw that thing again but I heard stories. Whispers about break-ins at other warehouses, workers going missing, bodies found torn up and half-eaten. Always the same kind of animal attack. Yeah, I know what it was and I'm one of the lucky ones. Even now, years later, I get cold sweats in the dark. I keep a loaded shotgun under my bed and always double-check every window and lock. Because sometimes, in the dead of night, I think I hear it. That scratch, scratch, scratching at the walls. I lived by myself in rural Arkansas back in 1967. Small town called Briarwood. My place was nestled right up against the Ozarks. It was a peaceful life, most of the time. I worked nights as a janitor at the local high school and liked the quiet. The house was a decent size, all built in white clabbered with a big old wraparound porch. It needed a fresh coat of paint, but my finances weren't exactly booming. One evening, I was about ready to head to work when I noticed it the stench. Like something crawled under my porch and died. It gagged me, no word of a lie. Well, I couldn't go to work smelling like that, so I got my big flashlight and decided to deal with it. This porch was raised up off the ground, so you could get around underneath, kind of a crawl space. I was nervous about going down there. Snakes, spiders, Lord knows what else but there was no way around it. I get down on my stomach, army crawling my way through the dust. The smell gets worse the further in I go. The light from my flashlight is slicing through the darkness, and that's when I saw them. 
two eyes, low to the ground, bright green, shining back at me. I froze. It was an animal, all right, but I wasn't sure what. I inched a little closer, just to make it out. For blacker than midnight, bigger than a house cat. Then it moved, slinked out from the shadows, and I realized it was the size of a damn dog. Snarling at me, fangs exposed. I scrambled backwards. My heart was trying to break out of my chest. Slammed my head on something solid in the darkness. Stars burst in my vision. I don't know how, but I managed to get back on my feet, tear out from under that porch, and run for the back door. I slammed it shut behind me and fumbled for the lock. That thing could be right outside, snarling and snapping, waiting for me to slip up. My breath was coming in ragged gasps. The back door had a little window, so I pressed my face to it. Couldn't see a thing out there. Just the empty yard leading into the woods. But I knew it was there somewhere, lurking. That night, I didn't get much sleep. I kept all the lights on and had a baseball bat across my lap for comfort. The next morning, I had to call into work. I couldn't bear the thought of leaving my house. I wasn't an overly paranoid type, but that thing under the porch, it had shaken me. When afternoon finally rolled around, I figured it was safe. I packed up some supplies, my trusty bat, and a heavy hammer then crawled under there. I couldn't take the stench no more. It was worse than before, almost like something had been tearing the carcass apart. There was no sign of the creature. Just a pile of what I figured were animal bones picked clean, and the god-awful smell. I started clearing it out when I noticed something odd. One of the bones was longer than the rest. Too big for a bird, too thin for a dog. And that's when I saw it, a small, delicate finger bone tangled up in the mess. My stomach lurched. That thing under my porch wasn't just an animal, and the bones weren't from some critter it killed for dinner. Those were human remains. I didn't stick around to investigate more. I just scrambled out from under that porch and called the cops. Didn't even take time to clean up just got in my car and drove straight into town. Deputy Wright was the one they sent out. He was a big old fella, known for being able to eat his weight in barbecue. You'd think a guy his size wouldn't be afraid of anything, but even he looked a little green when I told him what I saw. Still, he was a professional. He went to check it out himself, but he came out empty-handed. No bones, no sign of whatever it was I saw down there. Probably just a coyote, son, he said, patting me on the shoulder in a way that wasn't exactly reassuring. Don't you worry. I tried to believe him. But even as he drove away, I knew something wasn't right. Those eyes, that snarling mouth, those weren't the parts of some regular animal. I thought about moving, but I didn't have the money so I stayed put. Put bars on my windows, bought a shotgun, a couple big hunting dogs. Anything I could to feel safe. That was my biggest mistake. Assuming I ever could be. A couple nights later, I heard a crash downstairs. I thought it might be the dogs, just horsing around. But as I got to the landing, I saw it. Something was down there, its eyes glowing in the dim light. It was bigger this time, hulking, and it was standing on two legs. There was a low growl, and I recognized the creature from under my porch. It had come back. I should have run then. Gone out a window, anything. But instead I grabbed my shotgun, aimed down that staircase, and fired. I hit it, I know I did. But the thing just bellowed. The sound rattled my bones, and I saw it charge. I barely had time to bring the gun up for a second shot, but when I did, it was gone. 
No blood, no body, nothing. Then I saw a smear of blood on the wall and heard my back door slam. I ran to it, threw it open, and shone my flashlight out into the woods. The dogs were at the edge of the tree lean. They were baying and barking with such frenzy. I could barely make them stop. Something was out there. Something had wounded my dogs. Something big enough to make those beasts terrified. The next couple of months were hell on earth. I sold that house dirt cheap as soon as I could get the paperwork together. I quit my job, stopped going into town, hardly slept at all. That thing, whatever it was, started taunting me. I'd see those glowing eyes out in the woods at night, or hear it growl from the darkness beyond my yard. My dogs went half insane, whining in fear half the time, ready to attack at any second the other half. I could barely stand to look at them. They seemed just as haunted as I was. I started carrying that shotgun everywhere, even when I went to the bathroom. Every little noise made me jump, and I lost track of how many nights I barricaded myself in my room with every piece of furniture I could find. There were a few times when it must have gotten into the house. I'd wake up and find things overturned or a window wide open that I was damn sure I had locked. And the worst part, the worst, was the drawings. Scratched on the walls, done in something dark and sticky that I never wanted to figure out. Drawings of me. Drawings of the house. And drawings of that thing. Crude, awful drawings, but they showed it standing on two legs, towering over me. Hulking. Claws instead of hands and teeth. Jesus, all those teeth. It was toying with me. I knew it was. Trying to break me down. I finally couldn't take it anymore. Packed a bag with some clothes, the shotgun, a box of shells, and whatever food I could scrounge up. I loaded it all into my truck, the dogs whimpering the whole time, and I drove. I had no plan, didn't care where I went. I just kept driving, never looking back, always afraid something from Briarwood might be following. I found this old rundown cabin out in the middle of nowhere a couple of weeks later. I don't even remember what state I was in by that point. Missouri? Tennessee? One of those. It was cheap enough. I gave the guy what cash I had and signed some papers. Didn't even look the place over properly, just desperate for some kind of sanctuary. A few nights of quiet were all it took to make me feel like a fool. I got complacent, let myself relax just a bit. I stopped checking windows, stopped putting up barriers at night. That's when I heard it. A low growl from the tree line. My blood ran cold, and all the old terror came rushing back. I knew that growl. I fumbled for the shotgun, shaking so badly I couldn't get the damn thing loaded. I saw it then. A hulking form in the woods, and those glowing green eyes. It was bigger than ever. It looked almost excited, like it had been enjoying the chase. A strangled scream escaped my throat. I didn't know how many shells I managed to load before I started firing. Blindly, hysterically. There were guttural roars echoing through the trees, whether from fury or pain I don't know. Then the night went silent. My whole body was trembling. I just stood there, sobbing, clutching the gun like a life preserver. Morning came and I waited until the sun was high before I ventured out. There was no sign of the creature, no blood, no body, nothing. Just the torn up ground where I'd been shooting. I never found out what it was. Some folks might say it was a wild animal gone wrong, maybe some big cat. But I know what I saw. I know what was out there hunting me. I haven't left this cabin since that night. Too scared to go outside in case it's still out there, lurking. I got enough food stored up to last a while, 
enough ammunition to fight off a small army or one big monster. Sometimes I think about walking out into the woods and just letting it finish me. Sometimes I wish, for just one second, that it would come charging right through that door and make all this easier. But then again, sometimes, in the dead of night, I hear a new noise. Something scratching at the walls. And I know that the worst part isn't the fear of what that thing is. The worst part is knowing it might be smart enough to wait me out. Okay. So this happened back around 1982, maybe 83. I was living down in Florida, Fort Myers, working on a fishing boat for the season. Not glamorous, but it paid the bills and kept me in the sun. Now, a place like Fort Myers, tourist town, so there were all sorts of rentals you could snag for cheap during the off-season. I found a real hole in the wall a run-down old motel right on the beach called Sunset Palms. The whole place felt a little off. Paint peeling, sand in places it shouldn't be, a faint smell of chlorine and mold hanging thick in the air. Guy running it was named Marty, scrawny old dude with a comb-over and a permanent sunburn. Gave me that five-second once-over, then slapped a key on the counter without a word. My room was nothing special. Single bed, a beat-up dresser, and a window that looked out onto the pool. Well, I say pool, it was more like a glorified puddle that hadn't been cleaned in ages. Place was a ghost town, though. Never saw a single guest the whole time I was there. And get this, the whole left wing of the motel was all boarded up big sheets of plywood nailed over the doors and windows. Marty said renovations, but something about how he said it didn't sit right with me. Nights were the worst. The place creaked and groaned just a bit too much for comfort, and sometimes I'd swear I heard footsteps out in the hallway. I figured it was just the building settling with the sea breeze, right? Tried to convince myself, anyway. Then, one night, must have been real late, the moon was high and all the lights at the nearby bars were out. I wake up with a jolt. It's that footstep sound again, but closer, right outside my door. I swear my heart skipped a beat. I creep out of bed, trying to make as little noise as possible, and press my ear to the thin motel door. Silence at first and I start thinking maybe I was imagining things again. But then, there it is. A shuffling sound, slow and dragging, like something heavy being pulled across the floor. And let me tell you, my blood ran cold. Next, something bumps against my door, hard enough to make the whole thing rattle. I jump back, almost trip over my own feet. Whatever's out there, it's big. My mind starts racing. Some bum breaking in? An animal somehow? My first instinct is to barricade myself in the bathroom. But the little voice in the back of my head says, No, you gotta see what it is. So, I grab the chair from the desk. Best weapon I've got, honestly. Take a breath, steady myself, and I yank that door open. The hallway is empty the fluorescent lights flickering overhead, casting long, twisted shadows everywhere. The shuffling sound is gone, too. Now I'm starting to doubt myself. Maybe I was just dreaming. Maybe the stress of the fishing job was finally getting to me. I step out of my room, look down the hallway both ways. Still nothing. The only sound is the ocean outside, the waves crashing in the distance. I'm about to head back inside when I see it. Right at the end of the boarded up wing, one of the plywood sheets on a window's been moved just slightly. There's a narrow gap, and something, it's staring out. It's an eye, just a single eye, pale and unblinking. The skin around it is wrinkled and sagged, like, 
like an old person, but magnified somehow. For a split second, I think it's just the light playing tricks, but then I see it move, blink slowly, and a wave of nausea washes over me. That's no trick of the light, that's something alive. Before I can think, before my legs have a chance to listen to good sense, I'm moving. The chair's held high above my head, and I'm charging down the hallway like a man-man. I reach the end, slam the chair into the plywood with all my force. It splinters, but doesn't give completely. Just then, something screams from the other side, a high-pitched, shrill sound that cuts right through me. It's not animal. It's not human. It's wrong. I stumble back, almost fall, and that's when I see it, a hand clawing out of the gap, reaching for me. The fingers are long and bony, with jagged nails. They look like they haven't been cut in years. I don't hesitate this time. I turn and I run. I run all the way back to my room, slam the door, lock it, and push every piece of furniture I have against it. I sit there, heart pounding, sweat dripping down my face, and I wait. I don't know if whatever was in there ever tried to leave the boarded up wing, or if it just went back to hiding. All I know is that as soon as the sun rose, I was out of there. Packed my bags, dropped the key on Marty's empty counter, and never looked back. Sometimes, late at night when I can't sleep, I think I still hear that shuffling sound, 